Good evening and welcome to Chrononauts, a science fiction literature history podcast. I'm Nate and I'm joined by my co-host JM and tonight we'll be going to the moon. Are you excited for this journey? Oh yes. It's going to be a mad lunatic's journey. Yeah, I think it's going to be a fun one. Uh, we've gone here a few times in the past in the pre-Shelley imaginary traveler stories in we episode one. And in our last episode, we covered some moon journeys that followed in that kind of traveler mold post-Shelley. Throughout the first half of the 19th century, we can start to see the formation of a number of genre tropes that would continue to evolve throughout the latter half of the 19th century and well into the 20th. From this point forward, we're going to be covering these themes and tropes that emerge and form between the 1860s and 1910s, including the odd precursors from beforehand. Out of all the authors to emerge in this time period, by far the most influential are the works of Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. This isn't necessarily due to their literary prowess or novel ideas, but rather they both wrote at incredible frequency and were both incredibly popular. Uh, so in other words, they wrote a lot of books and a lot of people were reading them. L. Sprague de Camp called Verne the world's first full-time science fiction novelist, and it's pretty hard to disagree with this point. Mary Shelley wrote an incredibly influential early science fiction novel, but she really only wrote one science fiction novel, uh, though I really enjoyed The Last Man. I think it's science and science fiction elements kind of get overstated by some yeah, modern sure. critics. Uh, likewise, nearly all the other authors we covered so far only wrote a handful of stories that could be considered science fiction out of their entire body of work, whereas with Verne, this makes up a huge bulk of what he wrote. His Extraordinary Voyages series encompasses 54 novels between 1863 and 1905, and behind Agatha Christie, he is the second most translated author of all time. Wells wrote at a similar frequency, publishing more than 50 novels between 1895 and 1941, beginning his career almost at the end of Verne's. Due to their volume and influence, we're going to be covering both authors' works in future episodes, though not all at once. We could have chosen a number of areas to start with Verne and Wells, but the moon is appropriate place as any, as given its prominence in the sky and in prior literature. But before we get deeper into Wells, and Vern, let's talk about some fake news. Yep, it's long-going tradition of our time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In 1835, Edgar Allan Poe published The Unparalleled Adventure of One Hans Fall in the June 1835 issue of the Southern Literary Messenger. And two months later, in late August, an account of the great astronomical discoveries lately made by Sir John Herschel at the Cape of Good Hope was published over four days in the New York Sun. John Herschel was a prominent astronomer of the day, but his name was used by Richard Locke without his permission for this series of articles. Both the Poe and the Locke articles were intended as hoaxes, Locke being the more successful of the two at that goal. But before we take a look into the approaches and see how they differ, let's take a look at the three people behind them. Edgar Allan Poe is likely the most well-known American author of the 19th century, and he's certainly my favorite. Born in 1809, Poe wrote a great deal of cross-genre fiction, uh, most known today for his horror, but he also wrote a number of detective stories and some works that could be considered science fiction. He died young in 1849, but his legacy is still felt today, as there are constant references to his work in all forms and media of popular culture. Herschel and Locke are both far less known. While Hans Fall was an invention of Poe, John Herschel was an astronomer who lived from 1792 to 1871. Among his contributions to the field were the discoveries of four different galaxies, NGC 7, 10, 25, and 28. He was one of the founders of the Royal Astronomical Society, and his A Preliminary Discourse on the Study of Natural Philosophy was a major influence on a young Charles Darwin. The use of an actual established scientist rather than a silly-sounding fake Dutch name, I think, is <laughs> really what contributed to the longevity of the hoax. Yeah. So one thing about Poe, too, uh, as well as every area that he mentioned, that you mentioned that, you, that he uh, obviously has worked in, I think that a lot of people don't recognize him for his humor which is yeah. always in evidence yeah even if it isn't always hitting the mark it's very often in evidence yeah i mean his horror stories tend do tend to be more well known and they are very dark in tone but even there there is a sense of humor running through oh, yeah. a lot of them the black cat 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And always a sense of irony too. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And, and, uh, I would say that he is probably one of the early examples of, of like American satirists and, uh, many of his, many of his science fiction tinged stories also have this element of humorous discourse and irony to them. And since he was quite early in the kind of pantheon of American literature, that allows him to be very influential in, in what he wrote. He comes before, or roughly at the same time of a lot of the major American authors, uh, contemporary to Hawthorne and Melville, but well before anybody from the latter half of the 19th century. And as we'll get into, a uh, huge influence on Jules Verne yes. that we just mentioned. right. This story in particular. But far less known than Poe was Richard Locke, who was born in New York in 1800 and attended college in England at Cambridge, where he worked for a number of British publications. And he briefly ran a periodical, Cornucopia. He returned to the United States in 1830 and became employed by the New York Sun in 1835. He was a person of medium stature and had a face pitted by smallpox. Locke's hoax was incredibly successful, selling 60,000 copies in pamphlet form. The Sun subscription base increased to 50,000, and the pamphlet was in demand as late as 1859. Many contemporary newspapers uncritically republished the findings from the hoax. In a private conversation to a former Sun employee and current journal of commerce employee named Finn, Locke admitted he wrote the hoax, and the next day the Journal of Commerce denounced the discoveries forcing the Oops. sun to address the issue by mid-September of 1835. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the retraction, yeah. the hoax left a large mark on the public conscious, and a moon hoax-themed diorama was installed in the city saloon, and a play Moonshine or Lunar Discoveries was staged at the Bowery Theater. Locke himself permanently left journalism and writing in 1842 for a job in the Customs Service, and he died in 1871. So with that said, let's take a look at these two hoaxes. In the spring of 1835, Harper has published an edition of Herschel's Treatise on Astronomy, which deeply interests Poe in lunar investigation. Poe concluded that a telescope was not sufficient to bring out any meaningful detail of the moon, so instead Poe's hoax would take the reader to the moon itself. The unparalleled adventure of Hans Fall is presented as a third-person of account of an incident in Rotterdam, where a balloon in the shape of an inverted dunce cap and composed of dirty newspapers floats down upon the city, of which an occupant of a height of two feet emerges, and presents numerous things to Burgermaster Supervis von Underduk, including a manuscript written by Hans Fall, who disappeared five years prior under mysterious circumstances. Yeah, and there's a really funny description of him rolling head over heels down a hill. Yeah. On <laughs> <laughs> von Underduk. Yeah. <laughs> Fall, who was a mender of bellows, falls under hard times and contemplates suicide, and by chance he stumbles upon books on astronomy and mechanics, and gets inspired by the sciences. He creates a new gas that is 37 times less dense than hydrogen and employs it in a balloon, bringing some animals and quite the instrument collection. The balloon's rough start throws fall around violently, but it continues to rise. Poe references the Guy Lussac and Bio flight of 23,000 feet, and as fall continues to traverse through the atmosphere, we're treated to some relatively accurate astronomical calculations. He has concerns about the density of the upper atmosphere being less than the novel gas and creates an airtight vacuum bag around the balloon chamber for safe breathing. After going a few days without incident, he approaches the moon and the shift in gravity towards the moon makes him think that the balloon exploded, but he realizes he's falling towards the moon. He cuts loose the car and kind of crash lands into an inhabited city, which fortunately for him contains plenty of breathable atmosphere. He sends one of the moon men back to ask on his behalf for a pardon, and the townspeople of Rotterdam at the end are casting doubt on the whole narrative, thinking it's a hoax in text. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Poe is actually planning to finish this, <laughs> and it's a very abrupt, unfinished seeming ending in a way. Yeah. Just like, okay, uh, now there's some weird stuff on the moon and we're done. <laughs> and he claims that the actual Richard Locke hoax was the reason for him not finishing it. Yeah. Uh, to me, Poe is protesting a bit too much. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he says he <laughs> initially his... planned a second installment, but tore it up in frustration, claiming that he, quote, found he could add very little to the minute and authentic account of Sir John Herschel. Oh, Edgar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at that account of John Herschel. 
Locke denied having read Poe's hoax beforehand, and Poe seemed to have believed him. Uh, the two stories are quite dissimilar in how they set up, where Locke doesn't take us anywhere, or at least anywhere above the Earth's atmosphere. He frames Herschel's discoveries as being excerpts from publications in the Edinburgh Journal of Science, which was a real journal, but one that was no longer active in 1835. These observations were derived from a new kind of telescope with a seven-ton lens involving water refraction. Setting the telescope up 35 miles from Cape Town, which the real Herschel actually did in 1834, he is able to observe all sorts of things on the moon, including forest volcanoes, pyramid structures made of crystal, bison-like and goat-like animals, reindeer, biped beaver, monkeys, man-bats, a temple inhabited by these larger man-bat people. He also notes that the rings of Saturn are solid, fused together by gravity. Unfortunately, back on Earth, the laboratory catches fire, so nobody's able to replicate his results. The lens is saved, but the reflectors are severely damaged. Herschel was initially amused by the hoax, but he was later annoyed with the amount of people approaching him, asking him about discoveries he didn't make. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can see how that would have gone. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm going to take the credit for this. Why not? Oh, God, I wish I'd never had. Now, can I just write a book on astronomy that everyone will read so they'll shut up? So I thought that the, the lock was actually quite well presented, though, uh, yeah. considering. And it was good to read a little bit of background about it as well. And, and uh, there were some interesting developments afterwards. Like, I can't remember where they were based, but some scientists actually showing up at the office, like trying to do some research get a copy of the original Edinburgh Journal. Right. And the, the people at the New York Sun kind of like being a bit evasive about it and saying, <laughs> oh, we can't find it right now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, well, uh, we'll send you something in the post uh, later. And, and of course, they never did. But these people kind of reminded me of your modern fast fact checker kind of doing a little bit of research trying sure. to find out if this incredible claim published in the newspaper was actually true, right? And I right. mean, this was their field. You know, these were not everyday readers, these were actual men of science. So they probably looked at this and, and were a little bit incredulous, but also impressed, maybe, right. because Locke did, he did try to furnish a good amount of background, and I think he had a, a considerable knowledge of astronomy himself and physics knowledge at the time. Yeah, absolutely. It gets very technical in places, and I think as a whole it's a much more believable hoax than Poe in that while it presents a lot of fantastic findings, it doesn't present you with a very fantastic scenario. Herschel's right. just looking through his telescope and telling you what he sees, where uh, Poe actually takes you up in a balloon to the moon. And while Poe also does get very technical and scientific, I was kind of impressed and surprised at the level of detail in here about some of the calculations. It does feel very fantastic and not yeah. really as grounded. Uh, and like Poe was taking the piss a lot in yeah, the beginning. He, yeah, he definitely like, is. In the right from the beginning, you're like, oh, this, this little traveler arrives yeah. in a balloon, like dirty ass balloon, and and knocks the underduck over and uh, delivers this manuscript. And you know, there's the there's the whole business with the cats, <laughs> yeah, uh, which actually starts a long tradition of animals being you know sort of among the avant garde travelers to the moon. It seems to be a tradition that's carried on throughout various voyages as you have a, an animal accompanying you. Absolutely. You know, a pet of some kind, which is... Real life voyages, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. But in the case of the Vern that we'll get to, I think it's just a little bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really work. <laughs> well, there, there's definitely weird things with that issue of the Vern. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So Poe's narrator, Hans Falls, kind of experimenting on how the cats react to the, the changes in the atmosphere and stuff. And he does, he does show some affection to them, but then when he kind of loses the, side, the basket attached to the sidecar, they just fall. I think at that point, he's still kind of in the upper uh, reaches of Earth's yeah. atmosphere, and the, the cats just plummet to the ground, basically. They, right. He lose, loses sight of them in no time at all. He says he and, hopes they survive, but probably not, something to that effect. <laughs> yeah, it reminds, me of, uh, it reminds me of that old song, The Cat Came Back. Right. <laughs> they, 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 that so many little kittens and not one not one was ever found but the cat came back but yeah i was going to say something else about the uh the lock though the uh, the narrator the purported narrator of the lock piece mr grant dr grant who's supposed to be an assistant of herschel which i'm sure i'm sure that that name was made up 
Where I'm they, not where sure, they, actually. I didn't look into Grant. Yeah, there was Dr. Grant and Lieutenant Drummond. And Dr. Grant was the purported narrator. And he actually, even though it is true that the lock is generally less fantastic, uh, he did inject quite a bit of poetry into the narrative. And even Poe was mocking him a little bit for that. This is some of his semi-romantic notions, maybe. And I'm, again, I think it was a, an issue of Poe protesting too much. I mean, if you look right. back at, I don't know if it was in the, the one that you read, but back when we did Heidegger's experiment from Hawthorne, there's a little postscript at the end because there was an issue of plagiarism. And this was something that I meant to look up today so that I, I could say what it was exactly. But No, that's not ringing any it, bells. So I don't think it was in the edition that I read. Yeah, but it was just a very short postscript. And I think the way Hawthorne handled it was pretty good. It was just like two lines saying, yeah, whatever, it's not a big deal. Get over it. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. and then Poe writes, and Poe, of course, being a somewhat didactic writer sometimes, he just has to get right into it. And, it, and it, at times, because there's this whole rebuttal at the end of his own, that's put at the end of his own story, it almost seems like he's showing off showing off his erudition a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and and even, he even excerpts that French title page yeah right. i don't know if you saw that that's like a bit of a nod to his persian readers there yep. yep the balloon idea is definitely something that i i don't know that we'll see that too much again afterwards not really i don't think we're gonna really be covering Verne's balloon stories no I but think... i mean in the sense of moon travel right so i think there's some airship stuff that might be balloon based later on but the ideas of balloon as a feasible method of, of getting to the moon. Yeah, yeah that's, I, I think that really dies down. And also the, what dies down, I think, a little bit, with some exceptions. And I mean, even in the wells, we're still kind of in this. But the idea that, which is pretty consistent throughout all these traveler stories, that a single person can have the resources and abilities to get to the moon very easily. Right. Like, even this guy, I don't quite know how he manages to prepare a gas that's lighter than hydrogen like we're not really given any sorry hands fall here we're talking about again that's switching yeah. back and forth because we kind of covered them together but it will be necessary to keep them straight so hands fall you know he just managed to create this super light gas there's no indication that he was a brilliant scientist or anything like that and the humor angle of him being basically doing this as an attempt to escape his creditors right. who are literally on his ass when he yeah. is in that balloon yeah. and he actually blows them up there's a, there's actually a huge explosion when his balloon sets off yeah. and i'm pretty sure they're toast <laughs> <laughs> so hans falls probably hiding in africa somewhere uh ev evading <laughs> capture you that are still on the moon yeah. and what better yeah. place to avoid capture than well true yeah on the planet. Yeah. and I, I just don't know like i when i was reading and maybe maybe it was because i lacked the the knowledge of how it was published but when i was reading the post story for the first time many years ago i didn't really get the sense that he was trying to convince people that it was true and i kind of later grew to understand that poe himself was a fan of hoaxes and yeah he spent a lot of time writing about them or debunking them or right. kind of kind of like mark twain actually in that sense he did another hoax about 10 years later interestingly enough in the new york sun so i kind of wonder if that decision factored into him writing the balloon hoax in the sun that Locke published it in the new york sun maybe he was trying to get one up on Locke. perhaps so uh, i haven't actually read that story but what i have read was the one that it, it, it was kind of in the form of an essay and i guess it was talking about this chess machine Mm. There was a supposed chess machine with uh, that was self-operated, and he you know, like a chess automaton. And it turns out there was a little man running around in there. I think I've <laughs> shared that in. So I think this was actually something that he he had seen, or claims to have seen. Right. So how much truth there was in the piece that he wrote, I'm not actually sure. And uh, but that's an unrelated, but also hoax-based sort of narrative that he had going on. Mm -hmm. And often he'll do something like work really hard to convince you that something is true and then kind of pull the rug out from under you and then convince you how it's not. Right. He does get very specific in mathematical details and questions and concerns that the reader might have when considering the plausibility of traveling to the moon in a balloon. You know, like, all right, how are you going to breathe? What are you going to do for food? These things he tries to address in text, saying that, He's able to kind of drape a airtight bag 
around the balloon so that none of the air gets out. And he's worried that at some point the density of the atmosphere is going to be less than his novel gas, so he might sink back down. It seems like he's anticipating people poking holes in the story and, and trying to address those in text. Exactly. But there was a lot more uncertainty about various phenomena back then. Oh, absolutely. And just for, for just yeah. as many claims that something was true about what the atmosphere of the moon would be like, for instance, there were as many counterclaims. Sure. The Locke hoax managed to fool people for uh, a fair bit of time. Apparently, its power lasted for about a month. Yeah, I think that was about when the sun was forced to make a retraction. But even after that, you're dealing with a world that's pre-telegraph. So communication yeah, goes never very mind slow. pre-internet. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, even in the internet age, once misinformation is out there, it gets repeated and repeated even after retractions come. So Turns I can't even imagine be before the pre-telegraph era, something like that would stay in people's minds forever. As the preface to the edition up on Gutenberg said, you know, it was still well in demand as late as 1859, which is, you know, 20 five years after it was published yeah more or less. and obviously it was bad enough for herschel to start becoming very annoyed right i yeah. would have <laughs> i would yeah. have loved to have seen uh, an actual like newspaper interview or something where he was questioned about it yeah yeah i'm, uh, I'm not sure if uh, such a thing is out there but it'd be an interesting avenue to pursue <laughs> it reminds me of, of all those the, the famous things that quote superstars quote are always asked about that aren't true like Ozzy right in the Ozzy and the bat eating thing. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're they're definitely interesting relics of their time. I I liked the the humor of the Poe. I did think that his commentary afterwards was sort of unnecessary, but <laughs> it's it's Poe was a man who always he wrote a lot of stuff and yes. although a lot of it is interesting, not all of it is all that worth reading, maybe nowadays. And and but he was a man with a very active pen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this isn't definitely, so. is not one of his best stories, but it's definitely an interesting read, especially considering it's a major influence on what came later. Yeah, and it happens to be at the very beginning of several Poe anthologies, so I'm sure many people have just sort of picked up Poe and started reading that very story. Right, yeah, the anthology I have, that's a complete tales and poems. It's the first story. All right, before we get into Verne himself, I should mention that there's several recent biographies of Verne which are critically acclaimed, two of which include Herbert Lotman's Jules Verne, an exploratory biography from 1996, and William Butcher's Jules Verne, the definitive biography from 2006. And for this episode, I consulted the Butcher one. So with that said, Jules Verne was born in 1828 and attended a series of boarding schools starting from the age of six, the first of which overlooked a square where a public guillotine had previously operated. Verne dreams of travel at an early age, playing make-believe in the countryside, climbing trees and imagining they are the mast of ships. As a boy, he is heavily influenced by Swiss Family Robinson and other desert island tales, and begins to write poetry and unfinished novels as early as 1839-1840. He attended College Royale in 1843 while living at home, his father hating the school for its Voltarianism. As a teen, he writes lots of angsty poetry about his heartbroken feelings and his girlfriends and crushes. And by 1848, he's living in Paris, very promiscuous with women, frequenting prostitutes, and likely caught in STD. Verne is introduced into high society and meets Alexandre Dumas and Victor Hugo. I'm sure I'm butchering those names, so apologies to French people. That's going to be the case throughout this entire podcast, so if you're French, <laughs> uh, we apologize. Uh, I probably would only do very slightly better. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you do have the benefit of being from a place where that is the second uh, language of the French country, mom. but yeah, uh, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that helps a little bit aside it from, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Byrne was heavily influenced by Victor Hugo around 1848 and 1849, and by 1850, 1851, he wrote several comic plays. The play Broken Straws, which was described as a comic risque play, was the first of these to be publicly performed on June 12th of 1850. In 1851, he writes the stories The First Ships of the Mexican Navy and A Balloon Journey, which resemble his later work in tone and approach. Career-wise during this time, he bounces around clerking for various places, and he experienced some minor literary successes with Master Zacharias in 1854. 
His health significantly declined in 1855, where he experienced significant discomfort in the stomach and face, and he used a wealth of quack treatments, including most frequently a syringe enemas, to alleviate his symptoms. He got married in 1857, and by 1858 he was employed as a stockbroker. He sees some more literary success with his poems and art criticism articles in Salon. He travels abroad for the first time in 1859, completes the draft of his first novel, Paris in the 20th Century, in 1860, and in 1861 extensively travels through northern Europe, missing the birth of his son. In 1862, he meets publisher Pierre-Jules Hetzel, who publishes Five Weeks in a Balloon on January 31st, 1863, which initially sells poorly. Hetzel refuses Paris in the 20th century and rejects much of Verne's ideas, especially if they involve any sex, violence, or politics, as Hetzel was looking to have commercial success aimed at a partly juvenile audience. Here, Verne made poor contract decisions, earning nothing at all from the illustrated editions. Verne's income was roughly $2,250 a month in modern U.S. dollars, and by 1870, Hetzel was earning about seven times as much as Verne from his works. Typical. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> it was during this time that Verne publishes most of his most well-known works. From the Earth to the Moon was published in 1865 and revolves around a Baltimore gun club that is established during the United States Civil War. American ballistics and artillery greatly surpassed their European counterparts, and at the end of the war, the gun club has nothing to do. The president of the gun club, Barbicane, advocates using this firepower to conquer the moon, explicitly referencing Locke's moon hoax and Hans Fall. The mention of Poe elicits cheers out of the American nationalistic literary pride. Barbicane concludes that it's possible to hit the moon with a cannonball, and his challenge is sent around the country through newspapers and telegraphs. Barbicane consults the learned societies and astronomers, and much of the book is determined to figure out the problems of building the cannon, i.e. what material should it be made of, how heavy should it be, what kind of explosive powder should be used, etc. The scientific details are really quite precise, and that immediately brings to mind the precision of both Poe and Locke. Barbicane receives a rival challenge from a plate armor manufacturer named Nickel, who says that what they are doing is impossible and makes a series of public bets that they can't pull it off. Florida is decided as a launch site, and Barbicane receives a telegram from Frenchman Michel Ardan, based on the real-life photographer Felix Nadar, who insists that he be shot up to the moon. Nickel shows up, shoots down a lot of Barbicane's calculations in a public venue, embarrasses him, and the two challenge each other to a duel, and the calm Frenchman Ardan decides to mediate the hot-headed Americans. Fortunately for him, they are too involved in mathematical calculations even to have forgotten about killing one another. The three make amends, and after testing the chamber for habitability, the three get shot off in the cannon in front of a crowd of five million people. The explosion is huge, clouding out the sky for several weeks, and when it is possible to observe the sky again, it's revealed they went off course and are now orbiting the moon instead of on a collision trajectory for it, leaving the fate of our astronomers unknown. And now you have to wait five years for the sequel. Yep, which is Around the Moon, published in 1869. Luckily, we did that for you yep. in the space of a few seconds. <laughs> the sequel conveniently opens up with a recap of the last book for you, and then switches to the point of view of the astronomers who are inside the projectile pre-launch, lighting gas inside a sealed air chamber. So the science of this novel is going in some strange directions already. They debate if there's life on the moon, and after the launch, they're unsure of where they are or where they're going due to the sheer force power of the explosion. Their course is altered due to the passing in close proximity with a second undiscovered moon, which was based off of a theory put forth by Frédéric Petit, soon dismissed by the astronomical community. With them, they brought two dogs, one of them's killed in the initial explosion, but the other seems fine, along with their massive collection of food, water, brandy, and scientific instruments. They try to calculate their position using calculus, and we get some differential equations in text. They then realize they're orbiting around the moon, they circle around the dark side, see some active volcanoes, frozen water at the poles, and then they try to use onboard rockets and fireworks to break the orbit, but instead they get pushed back to Earth where they splash down in the Pacific. Since the craft is hollow on the inside, it floats, they're rescued, and then hailed as heroes. And that's basically the story. Yep. There is not a lot of human drama in these books. No. So if you are looking for that... Probably look elsewhere because the the only I have to say this this is I mean there are a lot of things I actually really liked about this especially the first book but the real weakness of it for me was there really wasn't a lot of drama 
right. the, the closest was the, when Nickel and Barbican decide that they're going to have a duel, and they're really at odds for a few pages there, and you think that, you know, oh, how's this problem going to be solved? I actually like the way it was solved, though, because... Vern is kind of, yeah, he may have his uh, imperialist sympathies and so forth, but ultimately he believes that I think that humanity should work out its differences mm -hmm. for the sake of science and for the sake of advancement. There's a lot of stuff about this gun club, obviously. They're the main focal point of the satire of this book, really, in the first book. In the second book, it's just a bunch of guys chatting in a yeah. you know, cannonball, yeah. basically, but... I definitely thought the first book was far better and far more interesting. The Gun Club is definitely a very naked satire of you know, wild, rowdy Americans just eager to blow everything up. But you're definitely right in the sense that the project takes on a very international tone. Yeah, a lot of I countries mean... pitch in financial resources to getting men on the moon, although Vern goes through a couple that don't. For their reasons. Yeah, he actually gives a list of all the contributors and sort of describes how they felt about it and how much money they gave and how this reflected on their national character. <laughs> yeah, so, in I that thought sense, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, Vern's very, he, he's poking fun at a lot of things in the first novel. And I think that's what makes it a lot of fun. It is very lighthearted. And he's very clever a lot of times at his jest. It almost feels like. Mark Twain in a way. Yeah. In that. Yeah. And I, I mean, really I... didn't expect that out of him. Uh, this is the first Jules Verne I've read as an adult. I had a copy of Mysterious Island as a kid, but it was way up on my head at the time. And I previously had a copy of Journey to the Center of the Earth, but it was a version that was highly abridged for children. So when I realized that, I stopped reading was it. Was it the version narrated by Tom Baker? No, it was actually a uh, print version. It actually might be the same text that Tom Baker narrated. I didn't download that I, to uh, see. Um... It probably wasn't, because I think that the abridged audiobooks were... It was definitely a tradition of the early 90s and, yeah. and late 80s, where they would basically take the original text, but just trim out whole sections so it could fit on two audio tapes. Right. And, and a lot of classics were done this way, and they would often get solid actors to do the narration and stuff kind of like they do now but tom baker definitely was my first uh ex well i think actually i read master of the world before i read journey to the center of the earth because he narrated journey to the center of the earth yeah on and i listened to that when i was about 10 or so and probably not long after that i read Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea so it's been a long time for me as well. I, I definitely appreciate the satire was a lot of fun. I think it was a bit facile, <laughs> yeah. you might say. Like yeah. it wasn't wasn't very subtle. Or no, not subtle at all. But uh, but and uh, the other thing we should mention about the God Club is they're all quote invalids. Yeah, right. They have their arms and legs blown they're, they're off they're from the missing war. Missing limbs. And, yeah. and, <laughs> So you gotta wonder, you know, why are they so eager to get back into this? Like, right. <laughs> why, why can't you know? Vern kind of says, "Well, they should be kind of hanging around, enjoying their it's retirement." Part of the American <laughs> character, you know, they love their yeah. guns and they love blowing stuff up, and they're gonna make the biggest guns, and make the and biggest, they're gonna explosion. make the biggest explosions they yeah. can. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what so they do just... when they fire the projectile. The explosion's so huge it like sinks nearby ships, and it creates this huge blackout cloud that nobody can see through for weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's huge, it's huge, and then the fact that he talks about the massive crowds that came to see this. Yeah, drawing how, millions. Yeah, yeah, and and you know it, it is it does kind of reflect how people actually did think about the moon and actually getting there a hundred years later, and how many people were interested, even mm -hmm. though you know you couldn't you couldn't gather like that, but certainly a lot of people were watching it on the television. Oh yeah, there were millions and millions of. of Americans, but not just Americans, and, and yeah, it was it was perhaps a different sort of effort altogether. Mm -hmm. But in a way, he is anticipating solenomania of a yeah. hundred years later. Yeah, absolutely. And he uses that word. I think it's so good that we got to make it the title. Oh, of absolutely. Podcast, yeah, but... that, that's already been decided. <laughs> yeah. For the second novel, I thought this was a major step down. I wouldn't say I disliked it, but it was like he wrote himself into a corner. So the entire novel follows the perspective of the three guys that go up, and they don't really have any control over the situation. They spend most of the novel trying to figure out where they are and, and where they're going and debating various elements about the moon, but 
nothing. There's some philosophizing. Yeah, which, no, which nothing really saving. happens. It doesn't really poke fun at anything. Except maybe for Michel Ardon. Yeah, right. He doesn't understand any of the mathematics, and he's constantly lost in the scientific discourse. He just yeah. cares about his heroics. But I don't know. I, I, In a sense, I think he wrote himself in a corner where most of From the Earth to the Moon is kind of build up to the fantastic scenario where you don't really have to explain anything once the explosion happens. You know, you get your guys sent up and you kind of have your cliffhanger ending, but it satisfies the arc of the construction of the canon and the yeah. firing of it that was introduced in the beginning of the novel, where I guess once you get into what the guys are doing when they circle the moon, it's, it's far less interesting. I thought, and I thought the ending was a bit of a cop out too. Yeah, I mean, I I think that if he had just ended it with "From the Earth to the Moon," it would have satisfied. End with the Big Bang, right? End with yeah. what you know that great American character that yeah. you're both satirizing and kind of appreciating does best. End with the Big Bang, and you don't have to take it any further. I mean, sure, it's a bit sad because you know they're not coming back, but the characters themselves even say they're perfectly ready for that, mm -hmm. and. It's so weird because the beginning of the book, obviously, America is being satirized, but many other nations are as well. And Verne, from the point of view of his American gun club characters, does poke fun at the French a few times. But later on, it's really the character of Michel Ardant that is the uh, catalyst for everything that happens. And if it weren't for him, nobody would have gone up in that cannonball. Right. They would have just sent it there. Uh, you well, know, that was the initial man, intent, which, yeah. Which is a sensible thing to do, because yeah. <laughs> you know, they know they're not coming back, right? right. <laughs> Why would they? But this Frenchman, single-handedly, through his powers of oratory, basically convinces everybody that this is the right thing to do. And because our gun club guys are so gung-ho, <laughs> they just go for it. Uh, it's really funny, because the most gung-ho of all happens to be the guy who has the least number of working limbs. Right. And he really, really wants to go, this J.P. Maston guy. He wants to go so badly, and Michel Ardan's like, oh, you would be a, a very incomplete representative of humanity for our first contact with the moon. Even though Byrne doesn't really, uh, he doesn't really get into the idea of lunar inhabitants in the sense that you don't actually see them. They are actually discussed a lot as a possibility. Right, and that's something that continues way later than I thought it would. The idea, especially that the moon has vegetation on it, is persistent in pretty much all the stories we've read for this episode. Yeah, which is really interesting, actually. Yeah. Uh, and then throughout all of those, um, I'm sure representing the scientific discourse at the time, there is always a naysayer. There's always... Oh, absolutely. You know, it goes back and forth a lot. Yeah. Like, no, it's a, dead, it's a dead world. But maybe it was not dead at one time. Maybe right. at one time it was more like ours. Mm -hmm. Not only is our dome the catalyst for this, Oh, everything that happens in, in, you know, in terms of people actually doing this and going off in this thing, which is a pretty scary idea. I mean, that, that yeah. <laughs> other than what you said about the second book, my main feeling from it was, man, these guys are just tumbling around in this piece of metal and they have yeah. no idea where they're going or what they're doing. It's right. like, you know, it's, it's talk about being alone <laughs> exposed to the elements. Yeah. So and it's a very small metal chamber too. So there's three people in here two dogs, uh, provisions for several months, you know, liquid and solid provisions. And some comfortable chairs. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't forget those. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, I feel bad for those dogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't really like the way that they used the animals in that, in, or the burn used the animals, really. In no. Sports. <laughs> Nobody was wearing seatbelts, including any of the animals, so they basically get thrown at the top of the capsule at the explosion, uh, which yeah. also happens to the passengers, and to it kind of makes you wonder true. why they didn't think that that might happen, uh, <laughs> considering Byrne does try to address the issue of the incredible force that would be put on the human body by such an explosion out of a cannon. He tries to write around it by putting, like, a bed of water under it that would dampen the force but that yeah. really wouldn't work i mean such a i don't think it's enough yeah no that would <laughs> obviously kill everybody on board instantly with the yeah amount of force and i mean involved. in uh, eric lapton's lecture about this he says that he thinks that Byrne actually knew this and that this was part of his satire but for that to be true 
you again have to kind of discount the second book. Yeah, right. And just say, well, that none of that really right. happened, which yeah. is fine if you want to do that. I mean, I personally do that all the time with like TV shows and, the same and way. book series where it's like, well, I like these ones, but I don't like these ones. So yep. to me, they just don't yeah. happen. Right. Because why would I waste my time thinking about them? Right, exactly. Like, yeah. that's what I always tell franchise fanboys. I'm like, if you don't like it, pretend it doesn't exist. Like, that doesn't exist unless you want it to exist, except in a piece of paper or celluloid. <laughs> Star Wars is the big example for that. For me. Star Wars is a big one, yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. hey, but snap your fingers, and you don't have to give the prequels a moment of thought. Nope, you sure don't. So, and I don't. <laughs> and that's, that's, no, exactly. So, but uh, no, I wouldn't say the second book is disenjoyable. It's just clearly a step down from the first, which I thought was a shame because I really, really enjoyed the first book. I, I thought it was a great, fast, fun read. It was really entertaining, really witty. I was impressed by the scientific precision, even though some of the ideas were dated by modern standards. I think it was really inventive at some of the ways he went about trying to solve these solutions, and it was a fun story. Yeah, and you said uh, when you were reading it that, that you thought it was probably, of all the authors that we'd read so far, the liveliest. Oh, yeah. Of, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think Poe is kind of up there, but, but again, that story was maybe not the best representation of what Poe is really capable of. No, I like the Poe story, but his best works like Mask of Red Death and The Black Cat and things like that are far, far above Hans Ball. I mean, not to say Hans Ball was bad, but it's not like a genre masterpiece. No. So I think we'll we'll be coming, I mean, in, in some of the Vern that we cover later, we'll, we will get to see a bit more of the human drama element, which I think is... is sort of lacking in these books even the first one a little bit and i think that it's definitely not something i mean Vern's big thing is progress and adventure and basically a version of the whole robinson crusoe ethos where you would kind of go to a strange land not populated by your creed and you sort of introduce civilization or introduce your values into that and yeah that's a very it's very colonialist and whatnot but that is a factor of the time that you just have to go with and i think i think Vern's positive attitude kind of shines through a lot although he did write some less optimistic works in his in his career yeah from what i understand paris in the 20th century is supposed to be a lot darker in tone than the works that had still accepted and ultimately published in this period which, while they do have some elements of satire and things like that, were partially aimed at a younger juvenile audience. And, and I don't think Paris in the 20th century was supposed to. No, and be it like was that. rejected and not published for a very long time. Right. I think it was only relatively recently, like within the last 50 yeah. years, it was first published, right? Uh, yeah, I read the 1990s. Okay. I'm going yeah, to do, do, do some more checking up yeah. on that because I'm kind of curious. Yeah. As to the history of that, but apparently yeah. it was a manuscript that was believed lost for a long time. Mm. And it was okay. actually discovered. So it's not like it was sitting in somebody's in tray, you know, waiting for yeah, all this right. time. I mean, uh, let's face it, no matter how poor it was, a Jules Byrne book that was unpublished would have been published by now yeah. if it was, a, you know, if it was yeah. easily within reach. Right. That's true. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's happened to many other writers. Uh, people try to capitalize on their legacy by publishing perhaps things that the writers themselves would rather not have had published. Sure. But they're not alive to really tell us otherwise. So eventually this the stuff does see the light of day. And now we're in a different era entirely where you see complete digital reprintings of basically an entire oeuvre of a person's work. It's even easier to kind of unearth the minutiae. But... Right. Uh, from the Earth to the Moon was definitely a very popular book, and there have been several adaptations. I watched a couple. One was the 1958 From the Earth to the Moon, and this was a very, very straight attempt to tell the story that missed the mark in a lot of ways. I didn't really like it very much. All right, so I made the comments about human drama a couple of times. Obviously, the filmmakers knew this, so they tried to inject some into it, and I get I appreciate that they felt that they had to do that, but I don't think the way they handled it was good. And 
some of the other decisions they made about the story, like taking away the Baltimore Gun Club and making it this sort of weird international weapons consortium, didn't make sense to me. They yeah, it doesn't make really the story better. Fit. You know, the whole point of the original novel is kind of a satire on American imperialism and that kind of attitude that comes along with war and militarism and things like that. And I believe the other one sets it in Victorian England, which also had similar imperialistic and violent tendencies. But making yeah. it kind of an international consortium from the beginning doesn't really fit the the gist of the story no it doesn't fit at all and, and then obviously it's kind of trying to have their cake and eat it too because they're trying to make it international and yet you know saying oh it's because this happened after the american civil war like somehow that was the only war that happened in the later 1800s <laughs> right <laughs> like, you know like somehow yeah. nobody else was fighting <laughs> anywhere in europe or anything that's <laughs> in africa maybe no no none of that not that wasn't real. The whole International Weapons Consortium deal is what financed the Civil War and provided them with their gunpowder and power and stuff. But anyway, so there's obviously an atomic. They, they, they have to link it in with atomic power somehow. So Barbican has actually invented a new element that is, I can't remember what he calls it, Power X or something like that. And it's this super explosive that is amazingly destructive and that can basically control the world. And they come up with the idea of the moon voyage. Nickel and Barbicane are like, they actually remain enemies throughout the movie. And Nickel was played by George Sanders, who's an actor I think is pretty cool. And, you know, he's the, the old scientist guy in the original Village of the Damned and kind of a very a pretty nuanced character for that kind of interpretation of uh, that kind of character. But here he's just, his character is just horrible. His it's just a horrible character all around. It's just self-righteous, basically like the protester against progress and, and basically saying that you shouldn't you shouldn't come up with something like this. He brings his own daughter into it. Yes, they had to add a romance element, so there's a woman. Of course. And, and he goes on the ship with Barbicane pretending to be a friend. And he goes on as Barbicane and his son, who's having a romantic liaison with the daughter, of course. So the right. daughter sneaks on board the ship because she doesn't, she can't bear the thought of not seeing her lover again. And so Nickel finds that he sacrificed his daughter as well. And he's just, yeah, like he's a real asshole and not in a cool, this benefits the story kind of way, but in a, there's not really any real reason for him to act like this. Like it's just kind of annoying. Yeah. So, and in the end they do make it back and, and uh, Barbicane starts to wonder if maybe Power X is too much for the human race. And I don't know. <laughs> It's dumb. Yeah. So don't watch it, even if you're a George Sanders fan, because it's not his best. <laughs> the other one, yeah, the other one was called Those Fantastic Flying Fools. And it was a really silly movie. Like, very silly. Yeah. Uh, that, that movie went way in the other direction. And actually, even though it is set in Victorian England, mostly. <laughs> not completely. But uh, Phineas Barnum is actually a main character in the story. So he is a famous American circus pioneer who basically created this touring circus that went all over the place mm -hmm. with all kinds of amazing sideshows and stuff. And Vern's book actually mentions him explicitly because there is one point where he wants, I think it's Barbican or like Grand or something, or sorry, Ardan to <laughs> join him on tour. And obviously the people that created this film ran with that idea and they kind of brought him into it although he's gone to england to escape his creditors or something like that and yeah i mean i like this one a lot more eventually I, it it took me a bit to kind of go with it and then i kind of realized it was sort of in this late 60s british yes comedy fantastical yeah. comedy tradition like right a lot of dad um, jokes. Um. Yeah, to be honest, and and this is gonna this is probably gonna be a considered a thumbs down for a lot of people, but I didn't necessarily think of that way. But it reminded me a little bit of the 1960s Casino Royale, like mm. the fake the quote fake one that's not really based on Casino Royale at all, and is all has all this all these different actors in it that were not getting along and. I think something like six directors were hired, and huh. it was a huge shambles of a production. 
Yeah, I haven't and, seen that one. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, considered the the I don't know. I guess the fake fake Bond, the other fake Bond that's not Never Say Never Again. Right. So interesting. It's, yeah, it's 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 got Peter Sellers in it, and Woody Allen and Orson Welles is in in it very briefly. Weird. It's really weird. Yeah, it's basically a parody of James Bond and spy stories. So, and there's other, there's some other films from the late 60s, early 70s in Britain that kind of have this, this tone to them. And it's, it's kind of a cross between weird fantasy and comedy. And it kind of reminded me of that. So yeah, it was really over the top. And there were some moments where I couldn't tell whether the, uh, the actors were like deliberately being crappy on purpose. You know, it's sort of, <laughs> I, I don't know. It just, but Eventually, its character and charisma sort of won me over a bit, so I ended up kind of liking it. And there's probably more that we're not aware of. You know, we could probably go down the rabbit hole for many of these episodes, checking out so many adaptations, because we're doing some classics here. When we go through Vern and Wells in particular, I think we'll see, like, they're probably two of the most adapted authors in the history of the fantastic slash sci-fi genres in general. Right. I mean, even Melier, one of the first filmmakers of anywhere his trip to the moon while not officially an adaptation of Vernon Wells is more or less a combination of the two together you have the launch out of the canon of the astronauts and then you have weird stuff actually on the moon which we'll see later in the wells yeah Vern doesn't actually get to describing any of that but yeah interestingly though they both have the same name for their moon creatures there's perspective moon creatures in Vern's case so do you want to do want to just briefly run down this? So this from the trip to the moon was apparently a very uh, influential and infamous early film. Uh, we're talking like 1902 here, I think. Yes, 1902. Yeah, it uses some really cool animation and special effects for the era. The moon is portrayed as having a face, and it gets shot with this huge projectile, and it's making all these like crazy facial expressions. A lot of the backdrop background and scenery and the way they do the creatures is really interesting for the day. Uh, the technology was very primitive in 1902 for filmmaking and yeah we're talking like well before there was really a silent film industry right um, I mean there really wasn't a film industry at no. this time. You had a couple people making these kind of films which were from what I understand Melier's films were exhibited with a narrator so this film had a script where the pe person showing the film would read it along, and you know you have the music accompaniment by a player there, but there wasn't like an established Hollywood studio system. And didn't he actually have to go on tour with with his films? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. this is almost more like an art gallery project. Right. He's done some of the earliest filmmaking stuff as early as the late 1800s. And certainly some of the earliest stuff that could be considered science fiction in film. Pretty much all of his films are around 10, 15 minutes long. So they're not exactly huge investments of time. And I'd certainly recommend to anybody checking them out. Because not only as a product of the time for being interesting, they're just like really cool looking films. They have, they have a very unique look to them. And he uses what very primitive technology he had very well. Was really a master of his equipment and art and you know vision for the medium. Now George Maley's Trip to the Moon is available on YouTube and although there was obviously no sound with the actual film, whoever put music to it chose something that's really neat and good and I don't know what it is but it was it was cool. <laughs> yeah, pretty much uh, everything uh, he made is now in the public domain. So you'll have lots of these, I wouldn't necessarily call them companies, amateur projects, whatever you want to call them, taking the films, cleaning them up, adding a custom soundtrack. Some of them do the narration, some of them don't. For any of his films, I would recommend the versions with narration rather than the ones without. For obvious logistical reasons, narration does not become a thing in later silent films. They tend to use the title cards instead to convey information, but... The narration really does give it interesting touch, I thought. Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, obviously, you know, it's hard for me to appreciate those kind of films, but having a little bit of, I mean, 
this is a direction that silent films could have taken. Right. You know, having a narrator. I mean, it works. And even now, it's an accepted technique. So, yeah. Yeah, it is, it's interesting getting into the, the almost the ancient history of film. <laughs> right. I mean, he's it's, pretty much the first major filmmaker. And while a lot of his works are derivative of the genre that was present in print at the time, he introduced some major filmmaking techniques that definitely influenced genre film from the entire silent era, even towards modern film. I noticed that now that we've covered Poe and Locke and Fern, I've noticed that the distance from the Earth to the Moon is quite a significant factor in all of these stories, and all the authors make a point of declaring that measurement. Yeah. It's pretty much the same, but it's varied a bit over the years. Mm -hmm. We're saying about 270,000 kilometers. Yeah, something like that. I think that it's actually a little more, but not much more. Yeah, no, they were pretty accurate with their mathematical calculations. Poe and Locke obviously tried to make them accurate to the point where they were fooling the public, whereas I think that's just legitimately interested Verne. I think doing these kind of calculations and figuring out these problems is something that he was really interested in doing, because you see the working out of the mathematics and trying to figure out, you know, what's going to happen when this happens uh, is a big part of the text. Yeah, he did travel abroad a bit, but apparently he did not respond very well to being on the water. He's like, immensely seasick. Yeah. So <laughs> traveling was actually very difficult for him. So the fact that he would have kind of actually got into the astronavigational side of things, both in a spatial and aquatic setting, mm -hmm. is it sort of makes sense. Because he wouldn't be the guy, he you know, liked to imagine himself on voyages, but he wouldn't have been the guy hoisting the sails or you know, like doing a lot of the manual labor on ship. He would have been the navigator, right. yep. <laughs> for sure. And, and that's what he would have enjoyed doing, and maybe had been able to see himself in a role like that. And he probably liked thinking of his audience, especially maybe the juvenile side of the audience, kind of thinking about it that way too. Mm -hmm. And he's probably one of, if not the first in a long tradition of science fiction writers who are basically either consciously or unconsciously adopting the mandate that they want to actually inspire people to take up scientific vocations. Right, and I think that was a big part of his reason for writing these stories is to spread scientific literacy and to spread scientific interest at a young age. Right. And when we get to the 1920s, I see that, that that was actually one of the main precepts of Hugo Jernsback, who started the Amazing Stories magazine, which was the first of the American science fiction pulps. Yeah. And not necessarily the best. It has a reputation for not really being uh, very literary. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the early pulps do, but right. that one in particular, you know, it's, it's not known for... Uh, it's, nowadays, there's probably... Not that many stories from the early days of Amazing that people would put on the upper echelons of science fiction stories, although they may be interesting historical curiosities. Yeah. But he definitely, he would actually mix stories with science articles. Right. And he would, he would actually have sort of somewhat basically written, I suppose, like we're not talking academic, academic journal level science articles. Right. But things about mechanics and, and physics and stuff sure. like that were often in the magazine, as well as reprintings of people like Edgar Allan Poe, interestingly yeah. enough. Yeah, I know uh, Hawthorne was reprinted in Weird Tales. Wells was reprinted in a lot of those magazines. I'm sure Vern was, too. Yeah. Well, Weird Tales was always more, it fancied itself more of a style kind of magazine. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't definitely aiming for the science fiction angle, necessarily, or trying right. to to encourage young boys to pick up science. Yeah. And I think that's, that, that is actually a, a theme that we'll see again when we cover future stories. Yeah, it's really interesting to see how the commercial trends guide the genre of what's being published, who's writing what. Because at the end of the day, as Vern found out, you have to please the publisher. And he was a commercial author. Right, exactly. I mean, you, you see that... I mean, I, I think later on in his life, he was able to diversify a little bit, but yeah, those works are not as well known. And again, we have his early rejected Paris in the 20th century, which was for not being commercial. Mm -hmm. And then sort of, I mean, not to say that they're inferior, but sort of 
adhering to the commercial demands and realizing, well, voyages are very popular with good reason. Yeah. Because a lot of people can't explore, but they would like to. So writing stories about, about exploring the world and going to outer space and going underwater and seeing the depths of the ocean and, and so forth, that was his main line for so long. And certainly in the 1860s, so much more of the world was unknown than it is to us now. Yeah. And in, it was around the same time you saw writers like H. Ryder Haggard doing their explorations of Africa, which was, right. you know, in the 1800s, it was known as the Dark Continent. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, there's a lot of things about it that we didn't know. And I mean, that obviously was a tradition that started before, but you, you'd see stories like that well on into the 1920s. Yep. Uh, uh, that lost civilizations and, and right. societies and, and cultures and so on. And often coupled with immense riches, mm -hmm. which is something we'll get to in our next moon voyage. So the next work we'll be covering is written by H.G. Wells, who is probably the other major influence on the science fiction genre from the latter half of the 19th century. Herbert George Wells, or Bertie as he was known as a youth, was born in 1866, one year after the initial publication of From the Earth to the Moon, to a lower middle class family. For biographical information, I used a Michael Sherburn biography, H.G. Wells, Another Kind of Light. It's a very good biography. Yeah, I thought it was I've very well written it. and engaging, and it definitely contains a wealth of information. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm looking forward to getting into some of the later parts of his life, because I, I don't know that I have either of us really got into the... Wells lived a pretty long and prolific life, Yeah. so... Like Verne, pretty much all of his most popular works are his really early ones. I think there's a couple exceptions with Wells. A Shape of Things to Come, I think, is later. Yeah, that's that's definitely much later. And yeah. that one was an interesting one because it was one that was made into a film yeah. that Wells was actually able to work on himself. Right. So, But yeah, I think for the most part, most of his most popular stories are the early stuff. Yeah, and there's a reason for that. But we'll yeah. get into it as we, we progress further. Yeah. So his father, Joe, was a gardener and cricket player. And his mother, Sarah, was a lady-in-waiting, but both of whom were educated. Sarah gets pregnant with Bertie at 43, after the loss of her nine-year-old daughter. And at a young age, Bertie took an age in sketching and reading, and was influenced by Heinrich Hoffman, who was a children's author with illustrated works, a precursor to the modern comic strip, not to be confused with the E.T.A. Hoffman, who we read in the last episode. Indeed. One night, he has a very vivid dream about Hell's excessive tortures, and that causes him to hate God and eventually stop believing in God altogether. And he becomes a pretty committed atheist by his teenage years. In the meantime, Sarah had been out of work for several years, and the Wells family was living on a meager income. But in 1880, Sarah resumes being a servant, helping manage the estate of the recently deceased Lady Featherstone Howe, which greatly improves their living conditions. Wells was appointed with servant duties at the same time, and while he hated the work, he read and did algebra problems on the side. Wells' father was not doing very much during all this time. Really. No, he was like a cricket player on the side, and he got injured, and he wasn't really able to do any He work. ran a business, but it, it seems like he wasn't very good at it, and he kind yeah. of gave up on it. Yeah. So Wells had an interesting background in that... Uh, you know, the, the so-called man of the house, which is the traditional role of the breadwinner, didn't really exist for him. Yeah, and their conditions were rather poor until his mother got reappointed managing the estate, which gave them living conditions, it gave them a more stable income, and it gave him the ability to be introduced into society, doing kind of apprentice work rather than lack of opportunities that a typical lower class person would have. But even given these new opportunities, he was really not a fan of any of the work. He didn't last long at any of his apprenticeships, often dismissed for shirking his duties by screwing around by reading and doing math problems on the side. His main interests were really in schooling and bookish interest. By 1833, he was working in a main classroom of Midhurst Grammar School, and around this time, he adopts socialist views after reading Henry George's 
Progress and Poverty. He was also inspired by Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man and Common Sense, as well as Plato's The Republic. By 1884, he achieved first-class passes and exam results and received a scholarship to study under Thomas Henry Huxley at the Normal School of Science, who was one of the leading scientists of the day. While Wells never really talked to Huxley while he was doing this scholarship, he loved his lectures and made sure to uh, attend them and pay a great deal of attention to them. At this time, Wells courted his cousin, Isabel, and got more involved in politics. By his second year of college, his academic performance starts slipping, and he does rather poorly. And despite performance improvements in his third year, he wasn't able to pass geology or have his scholarship renewed. And at this point, he was financially unable to obtain his degree. He took a teaching position at Holt Academy near Wrexham in Wales and begins to write a time travel story, The Chronic Argonauts, which is published in three parts in Science School's journal. He's injured during a rugby match, and after his recovery, he leaves for London, working various odd jobs, and at this time, he reconnects with his cousin, Isabel, and starts work as a photographic retoucher, becoming a science teacher later at the Henley House School in 1889. In 1890, he receives an offer from the University Correspondence College, which he pursues to earn his Bachelor of Science with a first class in zoology, and a second in geology in 1891, and becomes employed for the same college. He has several pieces published in newspapers and journals during this time and marries Isabel in 1891, but serially cheats on her and eventually leaves her in 1893 and maintains a relationship with Amy Robbins, who goes by her middle name, Catherine, but Wells calls her Jane. On May 17, 1893, he had a major stress-related hemorrhaging, which was nearly fatal. And during his recovery period, he was freed from his classroom duties, and it's at this time he's able to write prolifically, having published 35 short stories between 1894 and 95. During this period, he writes an early version of The Island of Dr. Moreau and The Time Machine, which was published in 1895 and was an initial success. The newfound financial income gives him freedom to write at a more leisurely pace, and it's during this time he wrote most of his well-known works, including The First Men on the Moon, which was written in 1901, both well-received and commercially successful. So the novel opens up as a first-person narrative from a character named Bedford, who arrives at, I don't know how to pronounce it, Limpney? Limpney? <laughs> Whatever town he is, off in the rural outskirts, to concentrate his writing on a play. Here he encounters Cavour, who is this odd little figure, frequently humming to himself, making buzzing sounds and odd gestures. And Bedford thinks he's such a odd fellow that he starts talking to him and Cavour says he's on the verge of something huge and attempts to explain his research and after several attempts he says he's discovered this radiant energy and discusses its applications in this sort of anti-gravity device. He mentions the works of Oliver Lodge who was an instrumental figure in early radio history and while helium was only formally discovered in 1895 it plays into the creation of this new anti-gravity device. Cavour, like some of his real-world equivalents, like Oliver Lodge and Heinrich Hertz, don't immediately see the commercial element to the discovery, but that's all Bedford can see, is the application of this new technology to make a lot of money. So as such, they produced a new material, Cavarite, or Cavarite, I'm not sure how it's pronounced exactly, in 1899, which promptly lifts up their bungalow into the sky. Since this is not really the most efficient way of doing things, Cavour <laughs> conceives a sphere as a traveling vessel, and him and Bedford here start referencing Jules Verne and start to think of empire and solar conquest. Uh, that's Bedford thinking of yes. the empire. Bedford is a reader of such things, probably, although he tends to lean more towards titbits, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> but but Kevor has no time for, for these sorts of indulgences. No. So he's not actually familiar with Vern. No. But Bedford sure is. Yep. So they build their sphere, and it works just fine, launching the two upwards. And they experience weightlessness, which is something that's not present in Vern. Everybody seems to be operating under more or less normal gravity. We're here, they're floating around, and they get disoriented very quickly. Kevor, in contrast to Vern notes that they are too small to be observed by the telescope, whereas one of the plot points at the end of the first novel and kind of going into the second is people on the ground from an observatory are able to observe 
Burns travelers, whereas Kavor notes that their vessel is way too be small to be observed by anything. Despite this, they reach the moon without incident, and though their landing is rough, they discover the moon has a thin, breathable atmosphere, which is fortunate for them. They notice some plants and some vegetation, as well as some booming noises that they hear from the ground, and they encounter this huge dinosaur-like being, which they call a moon calf. And around the moon calf is what they call a selenite, this five foot tall or so insectoid type being. Around this time, a pit opens up and they get trapped in this underground labyrinth. And in an attempt to feed off hunger, Bedford starts eating some of the moon fungus, which appropriately enough is quite intoxicating. Yes. <laughs> magic mushrooms are right. Yeah. <laughs> moon mushrooms. Yeah. The most <laughs> magic of them all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so while they're in this state, they encounter six selenites and are bound and captured by them. And when they come to, they're being prod and led by the selenites to some unknown location. Kavor wants to take the, I guess, more cautious approach and see what they're up to, but Bedford is having absolutely none of it, and due to their selenites prodding, he wants to fight them off. So he punches one of the selenites square in the face and discovers their bodies are incredibly soft. Due to the fact that the moon has low gravity, humans, by comparison, have super strength. To be fair, though, they were trying to get them to walk this, like, really, really thin, yeah. tiny plank, and Bedford, although, yeah, like, you could argue that he's lashing out thoughtlessly, he is also considered that perhaps they're not even aware that this might be impossible for humans to do. Right. And, and so, to him, it's, it's definitely an act of self-defense. Yeah. They're being led in a very dark unknown place where they can't really see anything around them. Everything's kind of illuminated by this eerie blue light. And they kind of deduce that the huge dinosaur-like moon calves are basically their source of food. <laughs> yeah. So I think Bedford is thinking that, wait a minute, maybe we're going to be the next source of food. And not without reason, but he instantly jumps to using force Whereas Kavor is more inclined to observe and not act. He thinks out. that they that can be reasoned with. Right, exactly. And he keeps trying these different ways of, of trying to communicate that they don't really seem to be comprehending. Yeah, uh, yeah. But they're the usual kind of first contact ways that yeah. are so much a part and parcel of later science fiction works. Like pointing at various things and right. saying words and making geometric designs in the air and stuff like that. Right. To and, show basically that you're intelligent. And as much as this story encompasses, it's a very early example of a first context. It's a common trope in modern science fiction, but by this point, there weren't really a lot of these kind of stories where they go deeply into exobiology and they discuss the theoretical possibilities of alien life. At this point, I guess outside of some of Wells' other works like War of the Worlds, a lot of aliens are presented as humanoid beings, just kind of like humans on a different planet. And often angelic. Yeah, right. Right. Like a lot of the things that we've done, even if the word angel is not used, yeah. that's basically the connotation like yeah. the uh, the Diachkov, uh, yeah. sorry, the Seagoff, for example. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, and even Bergerac and earlier authors yeah. kind of encompass that celestial, almost divine nature of the heavenly bodies. In Wells here, the Selenites are really alien beings. He adapts them to the geography and the environment, at least what he perceived to be the environment, and they don't feel human while they possess some kind of intelligence. They're clearly very alien beings that evolved on a different path than any life on Earth. But as Bedford responds with force, since the Selenites evolved in a low-gravity environment compared with Earth's gravity that's six times as strong, Bedford has a very powerful punch, and when he punches a Selenite in the face, his head explodes and kills a Selenite quite easily. So Bedford realizes he could easily mow these guys down, and, yeah, it makes him feel very powerful. Yeah, it does. And that's basically exactly what he does, is he goes on this rampage and starts killing all the cell lights in his way. Eventually he gets himself a couple of crowbars. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. To make it's, the job more efficient. Right. It's, it's a very dramatic scene, and Kavor is just kind of hiding in the back, not wanting to be a part of any of it. Yeah. Um, 
And another thing that influences the decision here is Bedford realizes that the chains that bound him and Cavour are made out of gold. So again, he starts thinking about empire. He starts thinking about strip mining the moon for resources. He starts thinking about colonizing and, and just how he can make money. Whereas Cavour, I think, is just totally gripped by fear you know he's seeing these crazy strange aliens that they don't know how to react to and bedford is just kind of going nuts smashing up dozens of them and now you know what situations kavor found himself into yeah i mean he wants to reason and communicate but at the same time i think he probably feels his chance yeah. slipping away yeah. like very definitively <laughs> as all this yeah. is going on yeah that option is definitely passed well it would seem so but yeah. actually when you get down to the nature of the selenites yeah it's actually not but that's that's part of what's going to be revealed later uh, right at least at this point in time he feels like that option has passed yeah yeah but after bedford kills several dozen of the selenites they're able to escape to the surface and they decide to split up looking for the sphere that they lost so bedford is the one that yeah, finds they it. lost it somehow yeah <laughs> they can't find it I yeah think I, during I guess, all that mushroom eating they right kind of, and the moon vegetation kind of grew too thick it's interesting that they never really portray large pools of water or clouds of anything like that on the moon but somehow vegetation so there is, is still vegetation yeah yeah <laughs> and the suggestion is that there's that deeper and deeper underground there mm -hmm. are a lot of those things mm -hmm. uh, and there is actually mentioned underground seas uh, yep. later so I guess there's just enough water in the ground to make that happen, but all the actual bodies of water have, have receded beneath the surface somehow. Yeah, the surface of the moon is portrayed more as a desert, whereas pretty yeah. much everything that happens is below the surface. On the surface, Bedford does find the sphere, and then when he looks for Cavour, he doesn't find him, but instead finds a bloody note saying that he was wounded by the Selenites. And Bedford decides to just leave him takes off, returns to the Earth, and splashes down on the ocean. And yeah. at this point, Bedford publishes account in the publication, The Strand. So that's not where our story ends. Yeah, it's a false ending. Yeah, it ends in a very interesting note, I thought. So in the real world, in 1901, Nikola Tesla claimed in a series of newspaper articles that he detected radio communications from Mars. These discoveries are communicated to Bedford, who discovers that actually... These signals are from Kavor, signaling from the moon. Kavor tells the Earth that he's been treated well, but with this kind of distance of alien curiosity. He makes several observations about the hierarchical structures of the Selenites, and overall kind of compares them to hierarchies of ants and, and other type insects. The fact that they're insectoid beings is really emphasized throughout the entire novel. And their social hierarchies kind of adopt this yeah. form as well as their physical form. He is able to communicate or begin communicating, I should say, with a few of the higher level ones. And where the language gap is sufficiently breached, he's shown to the Grand Lunar, who is the master of this Selenite civilization. And he begins to tell him about human civilization, including its tendency towards war and empire. And his last transmission seems to indicate that this was a big mistake. As at some points it's interrupted, and he appears to be trying to leak the recipe for constructing Cavorite for some unknown purpose. And the novel ends with this ambiguous cloud over the story. So, what exactly is the Grand Lunar planning? Why is Cavor trying to hastily transmit the recipe for Cavorite to Earth? You know, is the Grand Lunar planning a preactive first strike against Earth? Are they trying to build up their lunar defenses in case any humans try to go there so they're going to be ready for them? Nobody knows, and it ends on this ominous note. Yeah, it's very ambiguous, and I I don't know how, you know, you, there's so many different ways you could take this. Um, I'm not sure the Grand Lunar was necessarily planning anything more than suppressing the Cavorite to, you know, try and ensure that people couldn't get there, but, I mean, of course, there would be a later time when humans would be able to reach the moon by either Cavorite or some other means. So I think that they would have to plan something eventually and, and in order to stop this. And I think that the, the, the reason this is so interesting is that Wells really, really highlights the difference between the lunar and the Earth cultures. Yeah. And he does it in a very clear and very well done way that I think is, is very, very modern. This is perhaps 
out of all the things we've read so far, I mean, yes, it's written in 1901, so that also places it at a later date than anything we've read here so far for the podcast. But there will be things written after this point that I think are a lot less modern seeming than this book. Oh yeah, and uh, many of its think... contemporaries that are like dime novels written for children feel very, very dated, where this doesn't. This doesn't feel dated at all. I mean, aside from the fact that they didn't know too much about the surface of the moon and that there's no vegetation there, you know, this feels like it could be any modern first contact story. Yeah, a lot of the first contact tropes are here. And one thing that I thought was really interesting was the way he describes the selenites as being insectoid. He also basically talks about their highly specialized natures. And this is both in terms of biology and in terms of mental makeup, right. uh, psychology. And yeah. something that we we didn't really touch upon in the bio, but that might come up a little more later when we do stuff like War in the Air by Wells, is that Wells is very interested in social systems. And he's very interested in, I mean, we talked about how he became interested in socialism. And he, he definitely was very interested in hierarchies and in structures and in classes and in and we can see that again and again in a lot of his works is the way he depicts different strata of society and the moon society is so specialized that different selenites are designed for different purposes including yeah. purposes like communicating remembering solving problems so Whereas human beings tend not to be that way, uh, Robert Heinlein would say we are at our most ideal when we're not that way, when we're actually multifaceted and capable of performing many different tasks in many different disciplines and fields and skills. And, right. You know, he kind of idealized like the Renaissance man type ideal, right? Now, the Selenites evolved in such a way where their civilization is so specialized that their young are physically, they're, 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 there's a really unsettling scene when Kavor is relating his understanding of the moon culture where he's taken to a place where the young are basically physically stunted in order to be specifically designed for the tasks that they will be given. Yeah. And Kavor at first thinks this is horrible, but then he starts thinking about it and he's like, yeah, it, it's not nice but is it really any worse than what we do to human beings and we tell them that they're capable of anything and that they can do this and that and human beings know usually that that is the case but then they're basically stunted into the roles of their jobs or the roles of whatever basic often rote tasks that they have to perform in society mm -hmm. and and they might be capable of more but this specialization has happened to them so late in their life and it's not to their advantage. So it's an interesting perspective game that he's playing. I don't think that he's actually saying that the moon way is better necessarily, oh, no. but he's saying that, you know, there is, there is equivalent and something that you might see as horrible. And meanwhile, they look at our society and Kavor is, I think that in some ways, one of the most interesting things about this book is that uh, Bedford is, is sort of depicted as this brash person who, now he is the first person narrator, so he gets he gets all the point of view pretty much, which is an, also an interesting thing, but he is actually pretty smart. And in some ways, I think he has the Selenites figured out more than uh, Kavor does, because I think that he actually understands the nature of of them and that when Kavor goes to see the Grand Lunar and he talks about all these human tendencies and so on the Grand Lunar the thing that the Grand Lunar has the biggest trouble understanding is that there is not one leader yeah there's not like there's not this overarching power that basically controls whatever humanity is going to do next so when Kavor is speaking of humanity and their tendency towards war and conflict and 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 destruction and colonization and acquisition the grand lunar would have a hard time just thinking to itself okay well that's just Kavor talking right like maybe they're not all like that maybe there isn't yeah right right he would see it as this is equivalent to my culture if i directed the selenites to be this way or if the selenite matrix i guess you could call it like a collective 
kind of consciousness, although that's never used, but you would certainly see that come up in Star Trek and many later sci right. science fiction concepts. It concept. definitely introduces some themes along that line. Yeah. Uh, specifically the points where it says that there's no written records or anything like that. It's all stored in collective memory. Right. And again, there are certain, there are certain selenites that are designated that purpose. Exactly. That's their only purpose. Their exactly. purpose is to remember things. Yeah. If you need to know something, you consult a rememberer. Right. And the rememberer will tell you. And then the language barriers ble breached between the selenites and Kavor, but only because one of the selenites has a specialty of communication. And so all the communication that Kavor makes is done through this one selenite. Yeah. Regardless of who's actually... It's even even communicating with the Grand Lunar is all done through this one selenite. And there's another one whose specialty is to draw art and to make pictures. And that's what it does. And it finds Kavor an interesting specimen because it's he's so different and he's so alien. But he sees no other value in anything, basically. So I think that probably at some point Robert Heinlein read this book and was sort of repelled by moon culture. <laughs> That's my theory anyway. And There's definitely a lot of similarities between this and the moat in God's eye, especially the roles that are assigned based on the hierarchy to where they are in society. The aliens in moat in God's eye behave very similar, even though they're far less insectoid and kind of more, I, I wouldn't yeah. call them. I never read that one. It's okay. It's been recommended to me a few times. Yeah. That's uh, Larry Neven, though, isn't it? Oh, shit. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah I think. Fuck. <laughs> but, <laughs> Never mind. But that's, but that's still a good, I mean, you know, that, that, that might be a similar case. And I think the two of them might have some, Neven and Heinlein might have some ideological similarities going on. So, right. you know, it makes sense. Yeah. I was thinking of Starship Troopers, but we talked about this before. And, and I think that the movie might emphasize that aspect of things a little more than the book does. I don't really remember because I read it when I was about 10. So, you know, I, I, I seem to remember it going into a little more detail about the insects that the, the humanity was supposedly at war with. But, yeah, uh, the book is more focused on the military career. Right. Of the, the yeah, that's, that's definitely. Where the, the bug war stuff takes up, you know, pretty much all of the film. It's, it's a very small part of novel. But th this is also something that Heinlein railed against in his letters and in his writings and so on. It's this... Yeah. this he thought that humanity was becoming too specialized. He thought it was a symptom of communism, and he really, really didn't like it. So that was a thing for him, and he wanted people to go as far in the other direction as possible. And that's why he created some of these characters that are like, not only are they super smart, but they're capable of a million things. And yeah. <laughs> it kind of seems almost incredible, but yeah. he makes you know he's, he, he makes it so that you want to believe that these are, are basically super efficient and proficient human beings and that's his ideal person not somebody tied into a role that's basically their entire life mm -hmm. uh wells presents it in a way that's much more biologically linked and he makes it fair by contrasting it with human development and the ways that human beings go about their society and it's a contrast that doesn't always come out with the humanity in favor or in favor of humanity i should say Right. So he definitely explores the cynical side of human nature here with the only thing Bedford is able to see is money at any cost. You know, he yeah. wants to strip mine the moon, basically. <laughs> and oh, yeah. he doesn't he doesn't because... give a shit about selenite civilization. No. All he even... sees is well, the abundance he does a little of gold bit. and yeah. He thinks we can uplift him. He says he says at one point when he's high on mushrooms, he's like, it's the oh, white yeah. man's burden. And then he starts right. really explicitly talking about colonialism and stuff like that. Like, yeah. Very explicitly. Yeah. yeah. But he does actually make some pretty good conclusions about how the Selenites might think about things. And at some points, I, I do believe that he's actually more astute than Kavor about this. And maybe, maybe that's because Bedford is a more worldly kind of person. Yeah. Kavor yeah. is very lost in his own thoughts, and he's different from a lot of the other scientist figures we've seen so far as, you know, with Frankenstein and Hoffman and some of the others, you get this mad scientist type figure who's yeah. you know, either malicious or unethical or something like that. And Kavor is not that at all. He's very absorbed in his work, you know, almost to a fault, but he's not malicious he's not out to hurt anybody he's just this like absent-minded clumsy professor who's totally out of touch with the real world 
And in a sense, he's a comic character in that. But he's not a bad guy at all. He's not unethical. He's not amoral. He's just aloof. No, he's, I mean, he's a little bit absent-minded, but he means well. And yeah. He doesn't really want to do this for personal glory, or he doesn't, nor does he really have any vainglorious ideas about playing God or anything like that, which is not really, I mean, scientists feature in a lot of Wells' stories for obvious reasons, because it was obviously something that he had background in and was yeah. interested in. Yeah. But with some exceptions, I mean... They're often depicted as being men overcome by passion in some way or another, but it's a very, yeah, it is a very different depiction of the scientific, the, the um, advanced scientific thinker than we've had before, uh, before now. And he's not even able to see commercial applications for what he realizes himself is going to be a huge breakthrough in science, which I think is interesting because it is very much like a lot of the scientists of the day in the... 1880s or so through the 1900s, you see this kind of new electrical revolution. And a lot of the engineers, physicists, theoreticians, you know, whoever, some of them didn't see clear commercial applications of the technology. And I think that comes up a lot with, you know, even some of the technologies mentioned in the wells here. So at the end, it talks about the messages that Tesla claimed he received from Mars. And it's a small point of the book, but I think it's a really interesting tangent to get into just due to the fact that technologies evolve in a similar fashion as genres in a sense where they're not necessarily the work of one person and they can take all these twists and turns that might not necessarily end to the final product that we might think of today. So to give some background on the 1901 publications. In 1899, Tesla wrote to George Sheriff that he had detected messages from the clouds and asked him not to leak it to reporters. These messages are what Bedford claims to be picking up from Cavour. And in early 1901, Tesla's discoveries were written about in a series of newspapers where Tesla stated rather boldly, quote, signaling to Mars, I have an apparatus which can accomplish it beyond any question. And then he kind of tampered that a little bit later, saying, I only express my conviction that the disturbance I obtained were of planetary origin. Tesla is one of those showman scientists that yes. we talked about last episode. He's he's very showboaty in his methods. And he conducted, well, I don't know if conducted is the right word, but he expressed his opinions very publicly in newspapers, scientific journals, and conferences, and feuded with a lot of people, not just people like Edison, who he's, he's, he was known for having a rivalry. But this raises a very interesting question, not only of what Tesla's role was in the radio development, but what exactly did he pick up? So in recent years, Tesla's attracted a bit of a cult of personality yeah, that uh, <laughs> <laughs> more or less claims he single-handedly invented the entire modern world and that had his work stolen from him by Edison and Marconi, which is inaccurate to say the least. I highly recommend anyone interested in the quote-unquote real Tesla to read Bernard Carlson's 2013 biography, Tesla Inventor of the Electric Age, as at the time of this recording, it's really the definitive biography of the man and doesn't fall to, into the trap of hagiography like some of the earlier biographies do. <laughs> I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's really well written, and it really paints an interesting picture of a fascinating character. And he's a lot more three-dimensional than some of the more modern narratives of being this total genius who had everything plundered from him. But we'll give a fuller account of Tesla later on when we talk about the Edisonade and his public feuds with Edison. But for now, I think it would be useful to briefly sketch out a timeline of radio history and Tesla's role in it, given that these are radio signals that Tesla's claiming to pick up from Mars. So in 1887, Heinrich Hertz detects electromagnetic radiation, which was previously predicted by James Clerk Maxwell in a series of equations which would eventually become simplified and known as Maxwell's equations, basically the mathematical foundation for all electromagnetic theory. Hertz, however, saw no practical use for them whatsoever. He said, quote, it's no use whatsoever. This is just an experiment that proves Maestro Maxwell was right. 
we just have these mysterious electromagnetic waves that we cannot see with the naked eye. But they're there. Hertz died young in 1894 and never got a substantial opportunity to apply his talents to a rapidly evolving landscape over the next few decades. In 1890, Tesla repeats Hertz's experiments, and he's possibly the first person in America to do so. Tesla was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in what is modern-day Croatia, but he was ethnically Serbian. So that's a fun controversy of <laughs> who uh, exactly was Tesla and what his nationality, which we will not be addressing. My show. body has always claimed him as Croatian. Yeah, right. So, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he also says Croatia invented the necktie, among other fantastic, <laughs> wonderful inventions. Right, of course. <laughs> but uh, early in Tesla's career, he immigrates to the United States, and he repeats Hertz's experiments in 1890 and basically verifies what Hertz discovered. So Tesla focus on the electrostatic effects generated by his apparatus, not the electromagnetic waves. And he was very eager to turn the use of the electrostatic effects into a new technology. And what he believed is that he could transmit power wirelessly through these electrostatic thrusts, not Hertzian waves, which go through the air. In parallel, in England, Oliver Lodge studies the mathematical analysis to kind of connect Hertz's discoveries of electromagnetic waves with Maxwell's equations. People in Lodge's school of thought who were exploring the mathematical end were called Maxwellians, who Tesla very publicly disagreed with. In 1894, Lodge demonstrated wireless signaling using Hertzian waves at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History using a device called a coherer, which was previously invented by Edward Branley in 1890. However, much like Heinrich Hertz, Lodge did not see any practical value in these experiments. And while we now know that Hertzian waves can be used for radio communications, as they have been used this way for more than 100 years at present, this wasn't apparent at all to any of the early engineers, including Tesla, Hertz, and Lodge. And with these kind of new emerging technologies, new discoveries, and new experiments, sometimes engineers pursue leads that don't ultimately end up anywhere or see the problem from a totally different angle that we would recognize it from today. Which is a really interesting facet of yeah. early, early exactly. discoveries. Exactly. Yeah. So this is the case of Tesla's work. So he was primarily interested in exploring the electrostatic principles, which are at odds with how we conceptualize radio today using electromagnetic waves. By 1897, he moves more into exploring work with electromagnetic waves and develops a radio-controlled boat. So this boat was, again, publicized very heavily in newspapers at the time and introduces the idea of using electromagnetic waves to operate a vehicle. Tesla intended to sell the system to the U.S. Navy for use as guided torpedoes, but the Navy didn't pick it up due to them thinking it being impractical trying to operate these complex devices in the heat of battle. Tesla, again, publicly feuded over the practicality of this in newspapers with a number of people. Uh, T. Comerford Martin was the prime person. The discourse here getting rather heated and leaning into personal attacks. Seeing no immediate commercial success from Tesla's boat venture, he took these ideas of wireless power transmission into his experiments in Wardenclyffe, which was his big attempt to try to develop technology that would transmit power by wireless means, which also ended in failure. So Marconi comes into the picture here in 1895. Wells also mentions Marconi by name, talking about his wireless telegraphy apparatus. Marconi starts experimenting with radio in 1895 and claims to have made a transatlantic transmission in 1901, which was doubted by many people in the engineering world at the time. But the ability to signal several thousands miles was indeed confirmed a couple times in 1902, and regular transatlantic service began in 1907. In the next decade during World War I, the United States government infringed on several radio patents and promised financial compensation after the war. A 1943 Supreme Court decision tried to untangle all of this mess, looking at many of the radio early radio patents in an attempt to sort out who gets paid what. So a lot of the Tesla mythos claims that this decision overturned Marconi's patents in favor of Tesla's. This didn't happen as far as the decision goes. It didn't overturn any patents, but found that Marconi's patents were anticipated not by Tesla's, but those by Oliver Lodge and John Stone Stone. 
And no, I don't know why his name is John Stone Stone either. Stone's there twice. It's not a typo. So <laughs> it would be a little... Stone Stone. Yeah. <laughs> stone, son of stone. <laughs> right. <laughs> It'd be a little unfair to Tesla to say that he didn't understand the physics of electromagnetic waves in his early experiments in the early 1890s because nobody really understood nobody the did. physics this on. And it would take years after Hertz's initial discovery before they were really understood and put into practice. When Tesla died in 1943, the obituary that appeared in the May 1943 issues of the Proceedings of the Institute of Radio Engineers said that, quote, he aimed to start at one point on the sphere, electrical oscillations of superpotency, and by means of them to create standing wave patterns all over the surface of the Earth, withdrawing as desired the antinodes of potential. This theory of transmission of radio frequency energy is at variance with that now accepted, and Tesla was never able to bring his plans into fruition. But if he failed in practice in these attempts, none can deny that he aimed spaciously and nobly. Wow. This kind of raises the question of the nature invention. So, who is the true inventor of radio? Was it Hertz who discovered the principles but couldn't see any practical use for them? Was it Tesla who was possibly the first person to replicate Hertz's experiment and possibly the first to try to build something with it even though it was a technological dead end? Was it Oliver Lodge who was correct about the mathematics and whose patents anticipated a commercially successful system but didn't see any actual use for it and didn't build one himself? Or was it Marconi who synthesized previous developments with his own work to create a commercially functional system? The answer, in my opinion, coincidentally, is exactly the same person who invented the science fiction genre. No one. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And of course, one thing about radio, of course, is that radio waves have always been with us. Yeah. It's just a matter of discovering how to use them and make use of them. Discovering that they're there is not necessarily going to be the province of one savant. It just comes along and suddenly revolutionizes everything all at once. Right, exactly. And this is also a very simplified version of the history of early radio. There are several other engineers like Popov, like Bose, other people that contributed major developments and minor technological advances that all are pieces of the final puzzle. We can put up some links on the blog spot about uh, uh, radio development. Yeah. Uh, made some basic... I mean, it's pretty interesting to read about, actually. I've definitely done a little bit of background on that yeah. in the past. So. And technologies, especially from this point forward, almost always don't develop by some single guiding hand, but rather are a number of factors that almost emerge in parallel all over the world and are able to be synthesized by the investors that have the money to kind of put them all together and develop a working system. Yeah. And so when you were saying about these people not being always up for the commercial potential, I think Edison is an example of someone who was definitely aware of the commercial potential. Absolutely. And Edison is always cited as being important for his technological developments, you know, his improvements on the light bulb, his phonograph, so on and so forth. But I think the most important thing that Edison contributed is the establishment of what is more or less a modern day research and development laboratory. So he has his whole hierarchical system of people working on different elements of the problem to try to solve the overall puzzle. And you can see this model replicated in places like Bell Labs, MIT Rad Labs, Xerox Park, and places like that throughout the years. But the initial Edison labs were really some of the first you know, R&D labs to ever exist. So that's kind of a brief overview of radio and Tesla's role in it, but it still leaves the unanswered question of what exactly did Tesla pick up from Mars. So historians still have no clue. <laughs> you think he was just making it up? It could be. So yeah, some have put forth the idea that he was just picking up Marconi's experiments, but this is definitely not the case because their system used different frequencies. I like Wells' explanation, but it's unlikely to be the accurate one. It is possible that Tesla was bullshitting, which is something he was prone to do, but it's not very fair to him. Oh. In 1996, authors Kenneth and James Corum rebuilt a receiver that Tesla would have had at the time, and they were actually able to record a series of beeps from a Jovian storm, similar in sound to what Tesla had recorded or reported hearing in 1899. So maybe Tesla was hearing some kind of Jovian storm, maybe he was hearing solar radiation, 
maybe it was bounced back from Mars, but at this point, the record is very, very sparse, and really the only things we have to rely on are Tesla's claims, so it's very unlikely we'll ever what get a definitive answer. What is the thing about this Tesla apparatus, though? Like, it's an electrostatic rather than electromagnetic? Yes, yeah, so he, his um, ideas of generating wireless power, he thought he could do it by electrostatic means going through the Earth. These were his early ideas in the 1890s, but by the late 1890s, early 1900s, he had moved on to devices that do incorporate the electromagnetic waves. So he is claiming electromagnetic radiation that he picked up from Mars, which is different than his apparatus, which was to distribute wireless power through the Earth, which is, again, kind of at odds with how we understand physics today. So uh, when they uh, when they built this Tesla receiver in 1996, that was based on his blueprints? Yeah, I think based on his papers and his patents, because he did file quite a bit of patents. And He's been his... able to pick up signals from Jupiter. I mean, you can hear, you can hear what some of them sound like translated into sound waves. Yeah, yeah. But that's not through an Earth-based Tesla receiver, obviously. Right. Yeah, I, I wasn't able to get very detailed information on what they did to rebuild his receiver, but it's an interesting experiment. And while it's still a guess, it's an educated guess. And he could have picked up something really from anywhere in a solar system if it was indeed, in fact, something from the solar system and not just something bounced off of. From Earth's yeah. atmosphere that he picked but up. He by said accident. Mars. He said Mars. It's kind of. He like said Mars random. specifically. Yeah, yeah. He specifically said Mars. Because I'm sure there wasn't really too much of a way to directionally triangulate no. where the signal was coming from. No, so. the, the the first confirmed bounce of radio signals from a different body was off of the Moon, and that wasn't done until you know well over uh, 50 years later when Tesla was claiming this. So. The level of technology involved to be able to measure with that kind of precision was far, far off, to say the least. So, speaking of rivalries, we were talking, we've been, <laughs> we've gone off the, the subject of Wells into some really cool tangents, but Wells did have a, a somewhat more infamous, I guess, outside of its actual reality, but a rivalry with Jules Verne over yeah. the scientific possibility or I should I say plausibility of their respective moon journeys right and their careers overlap in really interesting ways because Wells is starting off his career basically in the final years of Verne's life so Verne is in his autumn years as this is published in 1901 so Verne comments on it quite publicly and he says quote I do not see the possibility of comparison between his work and mine we do not proceed in the same manner it occurs to me that his stories do not repose on very scientific basis. No, there is no rapport between his work and mine. I make use of physics. He invents. I go to the moon in a cannonball discharged from a cannon. There is no invention. He goes to Mars, and then it notes that he's incorrect here. Um, he's obviously going to the moon. Uh, in an airship which he constructs of a metal which does away with the law of gravitation. But show me this metal. Let him produce it. And then he is a little fairer to Wells later on saying that I consider him as purely an imaginative writer, to be deserving of very high praise, but our methods are entirely different. I have always made a point in my romances of basing my so-called inventions upon a groundwork of actual fact, and of using in their construction methods and materials which are not entirely beyond the pale of contemporary engineering skill and knowledge. The creations of Mr. Wells, on the other hand, belong unreservedly to an age and degree of scientific knowledge far removed from the present. So I, to me, I feel like there are two fundamental differences here that, that are going on. One is the respective interests of Vernon Wells, and the other is essentially the fact that Vern was at this point sort of very much in the twilight of his life. I don't think he actually, I doubt he read Wells's book. No, I don't think so, because uh, he does nitpick on the whole anti-gravity thing, but in other areas, Wells is very conscious of trying to be scientifically accurate, or at least extrapolating from current scientific knowledge. You know, he talks about weightlessness of the passengers, the selenites are evolved from clearly a foreign environment, and Verne doesn't really seem to appreciate 
any of this. No. And Wells did have plenty of scientific background from which to draw on. Now, physics was admittedly a weak point for him, and I'm sure he himself would have admitted that. Yeah. But it's not like he didn't have background in it all the same, even if his speciality was biology. So I, I don't think that it's fair to say that Vern has a more scientific basis than Wells does. Vern may have been more interested in certain angles than Wells right. was. Wells, I think, when it comes down to it, uh, he's really more interested in the people and the philosophy than in how something is accomplished. Right. I think that he's more interested in how it affects people. And that's another thing that makes him, a, a, in many senses, a modern science fiction writer. Yeah. And I think both these works, you can see the almost satire of expansionism and colonialism. But in Verne, they really feel like exaggerated caricatures, whereas Wells, they're more real people. And even though they obviously have more one-track minds maybe than a longer novel would let you go into more psychological depth or something like that, they still feel more grounded in reality than some of Verne's yeah. characters do. And it's interesting that, that both these books don't have very many characters but with the wells which is really only two people it's just the two of them yeah and the moon society really yeah. it counts as a third character kind of yeah um yeah. there's so much more to say about the human element in the wells there's so much to unpack and i think that it makes the book really rereadable because you can see so many parallels in humanity and in modern writing and in sociology and and different aspects that wills tries to cover and just make these uh characters even in his story somewhat three-dimensional yeah i think a major difference between wells all his scientific romances which are his most well-known works nowadays he wrote a lot of other stuff a lot of realistic quote novels stuff in the vein of dickens comic novels a lot of short stories but he's most known today for those five maybe six early scientific romances mm -hmm. and all of them have first person narration and i think he's really good at not because because wells is always perceived as a writer with something to say he's always perceived as somebody who almost obsessively hammers his points home and in his later career that is, is seen by some modern critics as a detriment to wells that he's almost too wrapped up in the political machinations of his time and he's always got something to say and he always has a point to make but i think unlike a lot of writers some of whom we may be tackling in this podcast and some of whom we've already tackled when wells has a point he has at least the gumption to make this delivered from the point of view of a first person protagonist who is always not perfect Right. And who you have to acknowledge may not necessarily be the most unbiased and open-minded person to tell the story. Right. But he's the person that Wells chose to tell the story. And I think that's actually a real strength of his. And, and actually making the story from Bedford's point of view is a real genius stroke. Even though Wells himself would sort of denigrate that later on when he was talking about First Men in the Moon, he would talk about Bedford and how he saw the character as this complete ass basically mm -hmm. but i think you know that that's a danger of having authors do interviews and talk about their works <laughs> right. you kind of see that in 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 filmmakers too yeah. it's like people yeah. trap them in a corner and they say well what do you think about that guy and you're like well you have to kind of say something but you'd probably rather not because you want the audience to draw their own conclusion right right and i think this is actually something that makes wells's books enduring even later stuff that's not necessarily that popular like war in the air yeah has this kind of it's using a very specific point of view but using it in a way that makes the story seem bigger by making you aware that this narrator may not be the most perfect individual to tell the story right and that's addressed in text here too so at the end when bedford is receiving cavor's messages cavor makes some comments like how he thought Bedford was kind of impulsive and rash and acting foolish. And Bedford is like totally surprised that Kavor yeah. would think that way. But meanwhile, he spent 
a lot of time in this book thinking that Kavor is just exactly. this, like silly old fool that he has yeah. to kind of take care of. Yeah, yeah, right, uh, right. And, and I thought that was actually really interesting because in a lot of the pulp novels that would follow this one, you have people going on these kind of journeys, and by the end, they're definitely buddies. By the end of this, Kavor and Bedford, even early on, they're definitely not really buddies. No. At first, you kind of, like, in the beginning when they first meet, there's a certain amount of, like, pleasure in the relationship, even though Kavor kind of wants Bedford to leave at first. But there's a certain amount of camaraderie, but that's sort of done away with in the face of adversity, whereas a lot of pulp stories and so on have adversity bringing people together and making them into fast friends and part of a team that's unstoppable kind of yeah. thing. The Bedford Cavour team is not destined for greatness. No, Bedford <laughs> just rages out and Cavour is horrified and spend most of the time hiding in a corner. And he basically has to be dragged around by Bedford, whose you know, approach to everything is just smash the Selenites. Yeah. And and Bedford then kind of I mean, he's he's reasonably good spirited about it, but he kind of he kind of comes across like he resents a little bit yeah. having to drag Kevor around now because this isn't really what he bargained for. Right. But at the same time, when he can't find Kevor and when he launches out into space, which, by the way, is an interesting thing, too, because Kevor didn't think that Bedford would have the intelligence to make it back home. Right. And again, I, I think that that is actually Kevor's major shortcoming is that he's a little too wrapped up in his own thoughts. Yeah. He's a bit short-sighted. He actually doesn't come to some obvious conclusions about the Selenites that Bedford does. And he underestimates Bedford's intelligence. And that, yes, he was able to make it back home. It's really interesting because, again, I think you see this reflected a lot in the future of science fiction. But there is a really interesting, introspective few pages there when Bedford is on his way back home. And he is alone in space. The idea of the man alone in space contemplating on his existence and uh, having these real existential moments are something that we'll see again and again in the future. And even Bedford has to admit that after this, he feels uncomfortably not really the same as he was before. Like, he feels almost like the way he was before, which was very assured in his place in the world and in humanity's place in the cosmos and... The fact that all he had to do was write this play to achieve some kind of financial success and all that. All that stuff has somehow been shaken to the point where he's not really as confident anymore about those things. He really experiences, uh, he misses Kavor, for one thing, yeah, because he's lonely. But then when he gets home and he kind of gets back into society, a lot of that sort of recedes. And, and he's able to kind of go on with his life. And then this radio transmission angle starts to enter into things. And it kind of brings him back to where he was initially with this, this voyage to the moon. Being alone and stuck in space also definitely made me think of the, again, what I had done was I read First Men in the Moon first. No, sorry. <laughs> I read From the Earth to the Moon first. Yeah. And then I followed it up with First Men in the Moon. Okay. And then I read the Verne sequel, Around the Moon. Yeah, I so, did both the Verns and then the Wells. Uh, right. But, uh, I like the way I did it because the Wells kind of broke up the, the Yeah, the Vern, right? I think you did it in, in the right way. So yes. while I said earlier that Around the Moon, the Verns sequel was a major step down from, from Earth to the Moon, I really, really enjoyed the Wells. And I couldn't say either way which one I liked more, the first Vern or the Wells, because I thought they were both great. They both did very different things, but I think they accomplished what they did excellently in, in I, both I cases definitely preferred the wells as a book mm -hmm. but the first Vern definitely had its charm and its appeal yeah coming back to the Vern and the second round the moon part after right. doing the wells yeah actually made me feel it was strange because i i because the wells was just sort of more emotional in general i yeah. kind of felt especially when bedford was alone in the sphere on his way home, I felt like there was a real, even though obviously he had to get back home in order to finish the story, there was this real uncertainty and this real like, wow, he's, he's really at the mercy of forces beyond his ken right now. 
Right, because like in the Vern in Around the Moon, Bedford really doesn't have any idea of where he's going or blasting off to. <laughs> yeah. He's just kind of riding so, the gravity. And know, Kavor just... thinks he's going to like spiral off into space and just be like adrift in the asteroids or something like that. But, you know, miraculously, he does manage to get to the Earth and splash down pretty close to England, I think, like right in the channel. I think it says he splashes yeah. down. Yeah, and he ends up he ends up in another part of England, but yeah. um, we didn't mention that the spear actually gets lost. It actually that that <laughs> yeah, right. Kind Some of boy a, takes it. <laughs> yeah, he takes it, and he probably does fly off into the asteroids yeah, somewhere. Right, right. And we never hear that Bedford was. He did have this idea that he was going to go back for Cavour with an entourage of people with lots of guns. That was his plan. Yep. But the loss of the spear kind of preempted that, so he wasn't able to do that. But that that was his game, and that was sort of going to fulfill his colonial ambitions and ambitions of getting lots and lots of gold, because it seemed like that was the primary metal used by the Selenites. Yeah, which is kind of a common theme throughout a lot of the moon works, is that they use precious metals like gold, and it's abundance with crystals and things like that. And there's this impression that there's lots of what we perceive as material wealth on the moon. And, you know, now we know that that's not really the case, but it's just interesting to see that authors from this time are picturing it as this kind of fantastic, wealthy, exotic place. Kind of like El Dorado. Almost. Yeah, right, right. No, I think, I think Wells definitely is our first example of an anti-imperialist author. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, he... He sees that, but he sees it as a not great thing. Like, he doesn't think that it's worth humanity pondering all these things because of because of the fact that there's another civilization there. And what good is it to satisfy human greed in such a way? What moral good, political good, that's the kind of thing that Wells is concerned with. Vern is concerned with the extraordinary voyage angle. That's right. his... That's his thing. He wants to tame the new land. Wells is more cautious about that. He, I mean, he's more cautious about it. He, he does feel like he can set, I mean, you know, again, this is kind of something that Wells would be criticized for by some readers, but Wells himself increasingly comes to feel like he could set the world right or make it better by his writing. And I don't think that's really something that concerned Vern at all. I mean, no. He's and entertain people, and that's, that's the, it. Really. The arc of his story versus the arc of uh, Wells' story have very different resolutions as far as what it means to real-world consequences. So with Wells, it's unknown what the Selenites are up to. And it just leaves it in this ambiguous state. And while at heart they're both adventure stories... Vern and Wells approach them in really different ways. Vern doesn't really seem to be concerned at all with the human consequences of what happens to the actions of the major players here. So when they shoot off the people to the moon and it's this huge explosion that results from the massive cannon, it sinks a whole bunch of ships and causes probably horrible human death. But it's kind of remarked on the text that they were, you know, noble sacrifices for this greater goal. And it's like, at the same time, what did this goal accomplish? You know, they didn't really do anything. They orbited around the moon once and they splashed down and that's it. Yeah. N nobody had the ability to really do anything, observe anything new. And it's like the whole thing was done just for the sake of doing it. Well, they did observe, they did observe that the second moon was real. <laughs> yeah, it's <right>. not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, a, a lot of the sense of Vern, and you really get this in more of the second novel than the first, which is partly why I think it's weaker, is he seems to be interested in the science and the algebra and the calculations, almost for the sake of doing it himself. We get differential equations in text and, you don't really see anything remotely like that in yeah. the Wells. He doesn't try to explain it with that kind of scientific precision. He's more concerned about the human elements, you know, how this affects Bedford's judgment, how Cavour would react to a situation like this. 
And there's a lot of exobiology. Right, exactly. Whereas with which Vern... Which I haven't really seen anywhere else except maybe Star Starsai. Yeah. And even that had a bit of the whole angelic strata kind of angle of yeah. previous traveler it, stories. Exactly. Um, but with, with Vern, all our characters do in the second novel when they get off Earth is just basically stick their heads out the window. There's really yeah. no human element here to right. where the story goes. And the first novel does work as a really good satire of you know American exceptionalism and the whole gun culture and things like that. And it's very interesting that it's still relevant, you know, 150 years yeah. later. But Wells does explore the human side of it a lot more. And his critiques and his observations on human nature, I think this is expressed in Arthur B. Evans in his 2005 paper, Jules Verne, Exploring the Limits. Verne and Wells kind of set up the dichotomy later on versus hard and soft science fiction. So while Wells is speculative and he bases it off of past science and technology could take, he doesn't take it to the point of Vern where he bases it only on technology that largely exists in the present day and explores it to a mathematical precision to the point where he's, you know, plugging through differential equations. Yeah, I think I think that Wells interest in humanity and in society is reflected probably in all his works whether they were science fiction or not and probably the strength of him as a writer is manifested that way and that is why he could sort of work in what now we would call different genres but that at that time the genre fixation didn't really exist the way it does now no, I mean, nobody was using the term science fiction either when no. Verne or Wells were writing. No, I mean, uh, they would say it was a scientific romance, Yeah, probably. But even then, you wouldn't say, oh, this is this is a writer of scientific romance. I, I think that those happen to be Wells' most popular enduring books. Mm -hmm. In the last few weeks, preparing for this and, and getting into a lot of different stuff around it, I've definitely become a lot more interested in reading Wells' other books other works yeah. than I was before. And I agree. I want, I want to see if it's true that, yeah, like his his politics really gets the better of him in his later years. But I also think, too, that he, he tended to write more realistic novels that were of their time so that perhaps they might be just as good. But it's the fact of the speculation in works like The Time Machine, War of the Worlds, First Man in the Moon and even the island of Dr. Moreau that makes them enduring in the present time where people can read them and not feel necessarily like they have to be a student of, you know, Victorian literature to identify with them, so to speak. Right, exactly. Uh, there's a certain appeal. Now, there have been a lot of adaptations, too, of um, First Men in the Moon. There was a recent uh, BBC one, which I was unable to watch, I did watch the 1962, I believe. Yeah, I really wish I had the time for this to watch that because I really wanted to watch this. And I'll probably watch it in the coming months and stuff yeah, like that. When, I mean, you know, personal life gets a little hectic, but this one sounded sure. really cool. It is pretty cool. I mean, I feel like Wells does have some comic elements, especially early on in the story. Yes. When they're on the Earth and also the whole mushroom excursion kind of thing it, it gets pretty funny but in general pretty serious story and it actually gets more heavy as it goes on mm -hmm. the movie the movie definitely plays up the comic elements a little bit and actually i think maybe comes off a bit sillier than it should the creature designs by ray harry hawson are i'm sure very yeah. cool that's one of the reasons why i really wanted to see this film because i I love his work in, you know, Sinbad and Jason and the Argonauts and all the other classics that I'm Clash sure a lot of other people have seen. Or yeah, first exactly. of Black Saucers. Right, yeah. right. I mean, they're now, they're just great. Well, Harry Hawson was, uh, it seems like he was obviously a fan of the book. Like, he actually read the book and understood it. He didn't direct the film. He, he was not very happy with how this film turned out because they were trying a lot of new film techniques that huh. kind of were like flash in the pan techniques. 
Right. I think of like names for them. I, I can't remember what they call it. It was something like supervision or something like yeah, that. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Like, you know, all these gimmicky like 50s and 60s colorization techniques and stuff Right, like of that. which there were definitely a lot. I mean, it was a very innovative time for TV and filmmaking. Yeah, but Harryhausen said as a result, they were not able to get a lot of things done that he had wanted to get done. Some of his designs were definitely used. There was a lot of stuff that was not used and a lot of stuff that they couldn't film properly. So he is actually on record as saying that he, he wasn't happy with the way that turn they turned out huh, interesting the cool thing was that <laughs> I, I had watched this right after those fantastic flying fools and <laughs> peter jeffries is in both movies really which is total okay. coincidence yeah he's yeah. yeah he's a pretty well-known british character actor he's been in like a lot of stuff he was in like several doctor who stories in the 60s and 70s okay and he was in a lot of other stuff too and he plays too he plays um Cavour, actually, mm, in mm. First Man in the Moon, and he is this really, like, over-the-top German caricature or something in those fantastic right. flying fools. He's, like, this crazy engineer guy. Yeah. So, he's actually in both movies, which is kind of cool. Yeah, the uh, the bit of those fantastic flying fools I did watch, the German character has, like, this pointed Kaiser helmet or whatever, and it, like, slowly lowers and it's like a missile that launches and, and blows up the structure. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's that kind of silly comedy. Yeah. It, it's really something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would recommend I would recommend sticking with it if at first you're cringing. Just keep watching. I think it'll eventually win it's over. It's definitely a, a mood it's that you'll <laughs> like or not like, and you pr might have to be in a specific frame of mind for it. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, First Man in the Moon is, is definitely more faithful to the book in some aspects, although they link it in with modern times, like the 1960s. They actually have it on the eve of the 1960s American moon launch, which mm. hadn't happened yet. Right. So it's kind of interesting. So what ends up happening is that Bedford is now old, and he's now in a sort of nursing home slash asylum type place. And he is watching, he's, he's apparently not allowed to watch TV, actually, because there's a lot of stuff about the moon now, and it gets him really excited, and he becomes <laughs> kind of uncontrollable, so they don't, want him, they don't let him watch much TV. But essentially, the moon landing happens, and they find on the moon this flag of a Union Jack, and they find that actually somebody has already claimed the moon for Queen Victoria. And it turns out to be the Cavour Expedition, which in this film has a woman tagging along. Hmm. Because, you know, you just, you got to do that. Right. And that. I guess because of the time frame, you know, if this was made in 64 and the novel published in 1901, Bedford and Cavour would be in their 80s or so at the time. So, yeah, you know, it, it, it does fit time wise. That's interesting. Yeah, it's it's an interesting take on it. The woman character doesn't really add a ton to the story like there's this whole subplot about she's gonna marry bedford and cavour tries to get them to sell their house and she kind of agrees to it and she's the one that ends up getting in all this financial trouble like it's it's kind of weird the way they do it like you almost have to commend them but at the same time it doesn't it still doesn't feel like yeah what she adds to the story is really worth it worth having there you know i get the feeling they try to invent a lot of those romance plots for some of these adaptations yeah you know they, they don't really work to be fair it wasn't as bad as the romance that was shoot into the uh from the earth to the moon film it didn't really add a ton now she added an extra layer of aggression uh -huh. because at some point she had a gun and she was actually like shooting the selenites mm. okay. um but in general, it, it followed a lot of the same pattern of of the book. The editing was a little different. Um, the the structure obviously had this whole wraparound framing device in modern times, and then a lot of it is a flashback to Bedford's experience. Right. Um, so in general, it's not bad. It's not bad. I would recommend it over maybe both the other adaptations, although, sorry, the Burn adaptations. Yeah maybe not over those fantastic fools just because there's something about it that if you are willing to go with its particular kind of humor i think it does kind of work. right and a lot of people do really like that kind of 60s 
cheesy yeah. British humor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I, I would recommend it. And definitely if you're interested in Ray Harryhausen's designs, it's one of his lesser known contributions to film. It probably looks kind of neat because, yeah, there were there were some weird color tricks employed and there's a lot of action like it is pretty action scenes <laughs> so yeah i don't know check it out i'm looking forward to getting into more i think that i started reading i read my first wells book many many years ago i always knew that i would sort of come back to him you know, i read a few in a row for a class i was taking uh -huh. in uh, 2000 or something like that yeah and this is the first time I've come back to him since. And I'm actually really finding out a lot more about him. And I'm interested in digging deeper. So we're going to yeah. be at least revisiting him twice, maybe three times more. I, I think more than If that. not more. But, so um, yeah, I previously read War of the Worlds about 10 years ago, I want to say. And The Time Machine, maybe five years ago. We're going to be covering both in future episodes. And I think we're going to be covering at least two more novels by Wells. Aside from that, uh, at least that's yeah. what we have slotted. Possibly more. He's certainly a major figure for 50 years, really. Vern, likewise. And his influence carries on. And, yes. And Vern, you know, Vern too. I mean, even nowadays, Vern definitely has his fans. Yeah. I think I think that arguably some of his stuff has, I guess you could say, dated a little more badly right. just because... Well, in a sense, it's, it's so... like we were talking about how technology develops and how genre develops. Sometimes there's these little weird dead ends that are products of the time that don't really go anywhere. And I think Vern, not necessarily in the moon voyage, but in some of his other ones where he explores hollow earth concepts, where he's doing like these heroic Antarctic voyages and things like that, you don't really see in modern science fiction as much, but they were very much in the public conscious of the time. Right. Well, I think a lot of it too has to do with that whole, you could call it the Robinsonade, was that the whole... Yeah the robinson crusoe kind of yeah, angle absolutely yeah. it's not it's not something that sits well today because of the, the colonialist nature mm -hmm. of it and the fact that it seems very let's come in and change everything and better everyone by making them more like us kind of thing and taming the untamable kind yeah. of thing nowadays there's a lot of uh, people kind of believe we should just leave things as they are if we find them because maybe they're beautiful in their own right and and I think Vern probably had a little bit of a sense of that, but he was really into this civilization conquest kind of thing almost. So now he doesn't go as far as some other writers as actually having depicting some pretty racist schemes. And I think we're not really going to get into too much of that stuff, but maybe when we cover some of the early pulp material, we'll see exactly just how bad it can get sometimes yeah uh, uh, that'll definitely be present in some of the lost world narratives which we'll cover we covered it in our third episode with star Psy of cassiopeia which in a sense is a bit of a precursor to Vern. i don't think it's likely that Vern read star Psy, but it uh, does kind of cover those same kind of french imperialistic yeah ideas that it being that french might have upon. had an influence on that yeah. too I didn't, maybe, maybe. um which is one reason why I'm really curious to see what the sales figures and reach for that was, because in a sense, it it, it does read like a clear precursor to Vern, but there's also no evidence that Vern even would have known who he was, considering he was, I guess, more involved with, quote unquote, the serious literary figures. Well, I don't even know if you need to, quote unquote, they were the serious <laughs> figures. I mean, Hugo and Dumas are pretty much recognized as two of the major figures in yeah. 19th century French literature, and for good reason, too. But when Verne was associating with these people personally, he might not necessarily have the time to come across more obscure works by lesser-known authors. So it'd be interesting to make a connection, if there's any connection to be made between the two, because Starside does feel like an odd outlier precursor that could have influenced Verne, but there's really nothing to support the idea that Verne would have been aware of him no and there is not much even to suggest how it might have influenced future writers which again is an odd thing because yeah. it just seems quite unique mm -hmm. in that sense and we we talked about that during that episode but yeah you know we were it's, it's very hard to find reference to it anywhere yeah so I'm, I'm assuming that it was not very well read at right. the time either. right 
So the last story we'll be covering this evening was written by somebody who was actually a scientist and an engineer. My uh, Russian pronunciation, I'm sure, will sound ridiculous to both the English and Russian ears, so I apologize in advance, like I do to the French listeners. So, Konstantin Edwardovich Tsiolkovsky was born in 1857 in the Ryazan Oblast of the Russian Empire. He was an avid reader at an early age, and he attended Moscow University, where he met Nikolai Fedorovich Fedorov, a futurist and transhumanist, and he was greatly inspired by the works of Jules Verne, which were widely translated into Russian at the time. He devoted most of his career to the study of mechanics of flight, and his early scientific works date to 1880. And in 1892, he was appointed to a teaching post in Kaluga, where he proposed the idea of an all-metal dirigible. In 1896, he developed a theory of rocket propulsion, deriving what he called the Formula of Aviation in 1897, and in 1903 published Exploration of Outer Space by Means of Rocket Devices, which detailed the functionality of spaceflight via multi-stage rocket. Most of his publications were of scientific and engineering in nature, and he wasn't really a fiction writer. But this one short story he wrote on the moon was an exception. Uh, it was written in 1887 and published in 1893. This particular English language translation appears in the anthology Red Star Tales. Despite the fact that he was a rocketry pioneer, no transportation to the moon is described in the story and instead immediately opens up with the narrator waking up in a state of disorientation, surprised at his newfound super strength. The narrator and his friend, who is described as a physicist, it's kind of an odd issue I picked up with the translation. He's described as uh, physique in the initial Russian text, which is translated either as physicist or natural philosopher. But I think in the late 1800s, it might have meant a more broad term for doctor, as we might see later in the story. Um, yeah. So him and his physique friend are surprised at their newfound super strength. And they eventually deduce by the fact that there's low gravity by a factor of six that they're on the moon. They observe several factors here, including a lack of atmosphere, which prevents sound from traveling as well as fires from being lit. The lack of atmosphere also leads to the fact that the sun superheats the surfaces that it touches, but the areas that it doesn't touch, it leaves incredibly cold. And both the narrator and his friend are rather confused at the fact that they're able to survive and breathe in such a place where there's no breathable atmosphere. So they decide to do a bit of exploring and bounce around the moon a bit, observing vegetation, again, like everybody else we've read so far, and they debate whether or not there was ever intelligent life on the moon. They go rather far in their voyages around the moon. It seemed to almost circumnavigate the entire body going from the equator to the poles and in these incredibly long voyages they lose track of where their house is and are left in a freezing state with no food and suddenly in the brink of certain death the narrator wakes up and realizes it was all a fever dream with his doctor over him gotcha. so yeah <laughs> <laughs> so this was a brief little short story that I thought would be cool to include at the end here because Silikovsky, like, or unlike Wells, Verne, Poe, and Locke, was an actual scientist and engineer. And I expected him to take a totally different angle with this story considering a lot of his work was in aviation and he developed early theories of rocketry and multi-stage rockets and things like that which would actually prove to be the technology used to get people to the moon in real life. You know, I thought we would see descriptions of that here, and that's not the case at all. Um, nope. Instead, we're treated to probably the most scientifically accurate description of the moon at the time. There's no atmosphere on here, and the moon behaves in ways that are physically consistent with having no atmosphere. The sound lack of transmission is a big one, as well as the fire's not fire being lit thing. because they try to deduce other ways to cook things. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. But there's still vegetation on the moon for some reason. And it's always in the surreal state of the fact that the narrator and his friend 
you know, are able to breathe and survive in this atmosphere that is right. totally hostile to human life. And even no mentioned, atmosphere is kind yeah. of undercut by the fact that they can breathe. Right. Like, right. It's kind of like he knows it, but again, it's sort of divine intervention. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Or something. Right. right. And the fire thing was very clever because. It's the kind of thing, again, that you, you will see in later works where people actually try to work out how they can do things in such a different condition. Yeah. Like a vacuum condition or the fact that the normal... <laughs> and, and the, the story, I don't know how much of this is down to the translation, but even though, yes, this is quite concerned with scientific accuracy, yeah. it's also written in a very conversational kind of... It is, uh, and that is actually... Uh, so I read this in both English and Russian. Because it's short enough, where you know I was able to do that. Okay. The way the sentences are formatted in the English translation, it's basically you know one sentence per paragraph most times, which is how it's written in Russian. There are some issues with the translation. It is like clunky in places in the English, and there is this one sentence that they translate into Italian. Uh, it says like "finita la comedia," and it's not like that in the original it's written it's in russian weird. for what that means so i don't know what the translation process was for including that you know it's an okay translation i think for the obscurity of the work and what it is it's it's more than an adequate translation it made it go better for me when i imagined the beginning as a space rock lyrics yeah yeah <laughs> right <jam>. it just, <laughs> yeah. And it was all in the first person, so I was like, "Yeah, why am I so much stronger? Yeah, why is this happening? <laughs> yeah, am I flying up to the ceiling? Yeah. Yes, I am." <laughs> you know, it just uh, it was funny, and yeah. I think it worked. I think it worked. It made it not be so dry as it might yeah. have otherwise been. The sentences are short and very punctuated, and it's interesting stylistically. I mean, he wasn't a literary figure at all. And I don't know what his connection to the contemporary Russian literary scene was, if any. I don't know if he was familiar with these previous Russian traveler stories and some of the contemporary Russian science fiction adjacent stories from the time. There was a rather popular work from the 1860s by Chernyshevsky called What is to be Done? That is very tangentially science fiction in that a character has a dream at some point and it's like a socialist utopia. And this book was like a major influence on Lenin, who oh. wrote a book with the same title, you know, What is to be Done. Maybe something Wells would have liked as well. Yeah, I'm not sure if Wells read that actually. I don't know to what extent it was translated into English, but after the Russian Revolution, it was you know, lauded as like a major important influential text. This is kind of, I wouldn't say an outlier, but there wasn't a major Russian tradition of science fiction in the same way that there was in the English and French speaking worlds. Uh, the stuff we read last time, you know, there were some other traveler story chapbooks from around the same time, but there weren't any major serialized publications and novels. It was all kind of odd outliers and a lot of the Russian fiction that is, you know, considered more genre fiction is kind of more on the fantasy fantastica element of supernatural, folkloric, weird horror adjacent stuff rather than more sciencey stuff. So it's interesting to see one of the earliest people being an actual scientist and engineer. Uh, this one had in common with those though that there wasn't really a lot of thought put into the actual mechanics of getting there. Right, yeah, and also the actual plot of the story itself. You know, they don't really do anything. They look around the moon, and it's cool, and, you know, that's far or less it. It doesn't say anything big about human nature. There isn't any real characters or anything like that. It's just kind of a fun story, and it's surprisingly it's better accurate. than Diachkov. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. but it's true. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> At least uh, Tsiolkovsky seemed to you know, give a damn one way or the other. Yeah, right? no, he, he put a lot of effort into the scientific accuracy here. And he doesn't take it to the approach of Verne where he's putting in equations in the text. He explains it in very clear, direct language that, no, you can't light a fire on the moon because there's no atmosphere. And he doesn't need to explain the chemistry or anything like that. He kind of explains the reality of the situation. And it's like, you know, okay, well, how do we circumvent this so we can able to cook our food 
So I think uh, we'll be doing a little bit more Russian space exploration type stories later with more mechanistic explanations for how they actually get that way. And it'll be interesting to see how much these kind of semi-realistic lines figure into that. Because even though there were some anthologies published, certainly in the 1970s, for instance, uh, I think a lot of certain things started to become more popular, like the, the Strogotsky brothers and so yep. on. And Isaac Asimov edited at least two anthologies of Russian science fiction. Right. Until then, I think that the, the developments in the genre in the across the east and west divide were very separated you know yeah. i mean right. sure Verne was translated but i don't think any russians were reading astounding science fiction absolutely magazine. not no especially after the so, revolution where no. it was much more much more segmented and these early pre-revolution russian precursors there isn't really the tradition in the same way that there is in the west of these kind of stories being majorly popular but that's not the case after the revolution. You see a lot no. more of this kind of fiction in the 1920s and even the early 1930s. Like with a lot of things from the Soviet Union, there's kind of a dark ages during the Stalinist times for reasons that are probably quite obvious. But after Stalin goes away, there's definitely a resurgence in this kind of science and speculative fiction even alexei tolstoy who's he not not the famous tolstoy but the other somewhat less famous writer tolstoy right the author of Alita. Uh, yeah he was apparently now he did actually win the stalin literary prize and he also wrote some science fiction supposedly i haven't read anything of that nature but supposedly some of his stuff does branch into the field and i i think that Probably science fiction did do rather well under the Soviet state just because it was a futurist, forward-looking, progressive thing. And that's how yeah. it was seen. And so as long as the genre didn't verge too highly into the fantastic, it was probably a good thing. And again, you saw a lot of very well done, well, maybe not a huge number, but certainly some very well done Russian science fiction movies in the 1950s. Yes, absolutely. And uh, one trend that you see with Russian, or I should say more accurately, Soviet science fiction literature and film is it portrays the prospects of futurism and doesn't really talk about, you know, like what Wells was talking about with kind of more critiques of human nature, especially during the more repressive Stalinist times. Oh. The glorious futurist elements come out more rather than kind of means of using fantastic environments as a reflection of human nature. Um, though this is more the case as the Soviet Union is de-Stalinized. I mean, some of Tarkovsky's films are very critical of that sort of thing and are oh, very yeah. transgressive in their own right. You know, but that that's in the 1960s and 70s, which is which is quite removed from the craziness and paranoia of the Stalinist times. But yeah, we're, we're definitely going to be looking at Alexei Tolstoy's novel Alita further down the line, which was a product of the Lenin times. One of the earliest Russian science fiction films was made from the novel that ran into troubles with the censors here and there, but it's really a cool film, even though at points it drags, but that's something we'll definitely talk about when we discuss films around the Russian Revolution, or works around the Russian Revolution, I should say. I did notice, too, though, that the Russian works, they do tend to be somewhat international in the, the way that they depict, you know, they're not, they're not, I mean, obviously, they want Russian society to be sort of held on a pedestal a little bit, but yeah, they're not like many of the American productions of time where you don't see any people from the Eastern Bloc, and if you do, they're the enemy. Right. They yeah. actually, I mean, you know, and it's not necessarily more enlightened, strictly speaking, but right. in the sense that it's, it's like they have this idea of a more global state. Yeah, so, so Russia, I guess at this point, uh, when Silikovsky was writing, it was the Russian Empire, um, though he was alive and, you know, conducting science experiments and doing engineering work after the revolution as well. Uh, 
But at this point, when he wrote this story, it was still uh, imperialist Russia, and they were expanding their sphere of influence in the east to the Pacific. And at this point, they had just experienced the emancipation of the serfs. Uh. The serfs weren't necessarily treated as poorly as slavery was conducted in the United States, but essentially the Russian serfs had no rights, were unable to own property or live freely. And when they were emancipated, it rapidly and drastically changed Russian society. And you see these revolutionary ideas propagating very quickly. So around the time of Sialkovsky's writing this in 88, and it was published in 1893, you had contemporary works uh, and works that would be published within the next decade or so, despite the fact that they were before the revolution, advocating very strongly for the ideas that Lenin would take up. Which makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that right. stuff didn't just happen in a vacuum. Exactly. Right? Like yeah. Just, just, yeah. Uh, yeah. That stuff definitely ferments very heavily in the 1880s and 1890s in Russian society. And Silikovsky kind of tends to be separate from all that. Like, there's no political overtones at all in yeah. this work, or no commentaries on human nature or anything like that. It's just completely a scientific exercise. And, you know, I think that really sets it apart from a lot of Russian literature you see at the time. I mean, Dostoevsky is talking about the newfound socialist ideas of people and how he <laughs> is not a fan of the ideology at all. <laughs> Political overtones are very big in the more famous of the Tolstoy's work, both in War and Peace as a historical retrospective and yeah. Anna Karenina as a more contemporary look at society and things like that. But this is completely divorced from any real world commentary. It's just looking at things on the moon of how it would be like if you were actually there. And there doesn't seem to be any greater thought of what that would mean, what it would be like if people were to actually achieve that goal and come back. It's just yeah. a purely scientific speculation and exercise. Of anything, it maybe closely resembles the Johannes Kepler story yeah. that we did. And yeah. A, you know, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not, I mean, he was not a writer. Like, you got to face, he's not a literary person. Mm -hmm. This is just an exercise that he decided to do. Maybe for the fun of it. Maybe for the semi-educational purpose of it. Maybe just because he was bored? Who knows? Yeah, no, but, I mean, he was uh, quite young when he wrote this. He was born in 1857, and he wrote this in 1887 when he was 30. So still a young man, not necessarily college age, but early in his career enough where he's probably not 100% certain, you know, what he wants to do, you know, has other interests. And when you're really into Jules Verne, you think you might try your hand at it yourself. You know, why not? Yeah, it was uh, an interesting read. Definitely ended rather abruptly. Yeah. Uh, just kind of waking up. But, yeah. I mean, there was no other way. Like, they were either going to die or wake up, right, yeah. I guess. <laughs> so. <laughs> Though I'm kind of surprised they didn't die because, like I said, along with other Russian literature at the time, uh, it tends to be quite bleak. You know, Dostoevsky stories don't normally have happy endings. Yeah, we definitely have some coming up of yeah. that nature. Yeah. We definitely yeah. do. So, uh, why don't we close off then and talk about where people can find us and what's going to happen next time. You can find us on Facebook at Chrononauts Podcast. And you can also find us at chrononautspodcast.blogspot.com for the text and translations that we've posted so far that are in the public domain. And you can find us on Twitter at chrononautssf. We are also on YouTube, all our past episodes are available on youtube yes so you can listen to us there and also of course on anchor.fm and all the subsequent podcast platforms yeah i think it distributes it to most of them i'm not entirely sure it does a good job i think I and mean, we also have a goodreads group that if you search for chrononauts on goodreads you can see the works we're covering in the future that we've covered and our opinions of the books 
that we've covered. Maybe a little bit yeah. beyond what we expressed here, maybe a little bit the same of what we expressed here, but we've expressed them on really Goodreads regardless. I to add more to the Goodreads. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I haven't really been uh, adding anything on Goodreads for a while, either on my personal thing or otherwise, so yeah. I definitely need that. I want to get on that because it's a good, it's a really good resource. The site's a bit cluttered, but uh, yeah. it's generally a really good resource yeah. for people into this uh, this kind of stuff. I like it a lot, especially the ability to track what I've read and you know what yeah. I thought about it previously and when I read it and all that. It's, it's it's a really good site. So next time we'll actually be covering a staple of science fiction literature, and we'll be going into some early examples of time travel literature. And I'm sure some people have been looking forward to some of these materials being covered. We're going to revisit H.G. Wells and his famous work, The Time Machine. We're also going to be covering the work of a Spanish author named Enrique Gaspar Rimbaud. And the name of the work is Anacronopeta. Uh, not quite sure if I'm pronouncing that right. We'll get it right by the time we actually do the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be doing those and uh, one or two shorter works. And I think that's going to be interesting because everyone always... Th th this is something that I, I think is an important distinction, but whether the time travel is meditated by human action or whether it is spontaneously generated by something like divine intervention, which we've already seen in, for example, the Petersburg letters, yeah. where someone basically dreams themselves into the future or is mesmerized into seeing a vision of the future. Right. Uh, you see that kind of stuff a lot. At a future time, in a different episode, we'll be doing something like Mark Twain's The Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, where somebody basically just travels back in time by being hit on the head. We see Buck Rogers going into the future later on by being gassed, essentially, and just kind of waking up there. Uh, there's a lot of, of various means of, of getting to different time periods that's described in various forms of science fiction literature. And I think that sometimes the time travel is not necessarily the main thrust of the story. It might be a different angle, and that's why we'll be covering the Mark Twain in a different episode, because I think the angle is a little bit different. Yeah. These two major works that we're covering next time are works in which the mechanism of time travel is actually sort of central to the story itself. So I think that's a difference, and I think uh, that'll be a good episode. I'm looking forward to getting into the more obscure work that I'm not familiar with, so it's going to be fun to talk about that. Yeah, and there's a couple other short works that I think will right. be interesting to get into, as they're also all precursors to Wells's Time Machine. So it's interesting to see how the idea evolves. The earliest thing we're going to be reading is a Japanese folklore story where parts of it date back to the 8th century. We're going to be reading a very brief, very brief Hans Christian Andersen story from 1857 and Edward Page Mitchell's The Clock That Went Backward from 1881. So it'll be interesting to see how these things factor into Wells and how things develop in parallel with Gaspar in Spain. All right. I think that's it for Chrononauts today. So good night, everyone, and thanks for listening. Thanks, and have a good night. We'll see you next time.